Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the Jim Cornette Experience. How many wrestling matches could a wrestler wrestle if a wrestler could wrestle wrestling matches? That's the question we're going to answer today on the fine program. And joining me, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you. Have you got a problem with him? The great Brian Last, everybody. Aloha, Jim. Would you like to step outside? Don't make me lunge at you. <laughs> Pleasure to be here once again. If you do, I fear any sort of incident will lead to the removal of my brain, but as long as I get it back, I should be okay. There's a lot of missing brains in the wrestling business these days. Uh, how much of this can we do? Can we take? Can we tolerate? Can we put up with? Can we endure? Well, we seem to be trying for the record. <laughs> whatever whatever that record is, we seem to be going for it. Uh, wrestling fans around the world, we're in this with you. They're bombarding us with content. Do you realize that in the the week, or however many days, maybe eight days, between August 27th and September the 3rd, AEW and WWE alone, not counting any other wrestling promotion, large, small, big, indifferent on the planet Earth, AEW and WWE are presenting us, or have already presented us, or in the, are in the process of presenting us, three different pay-per-views of a total of 11 hours-ish, depending on, you know, where the, all the pre-show business lies, and 12 hours of television on national cable alone, plus whatever they do for their ancillary outlets, which means that in, in eight days is the output of almost 20 full-time pro wrestling territories in 1980. Two companies. How the fuck do they expect everybody, anybody, to keep up with this shit? And I don't know about you, my sleep is disrupted. I'm, I'm starting to have bad dreams. I'm getting the jimmy legs. No pun intended. I'm, I'm having spasms in the middle of the night. It, it's almost like we've been watching this, then talking about it, then watching it talk about it. It's like that um, Morgan Spurlock was the fellow's name. He may be dead now because of what he did to himself. Remember, he did the experiment, did a documentary film about it. He ate nothing but McDonald's for 30 days. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. By the end of the 30 days, his doctor and his girlfriend and everybody else was begging him, you're poisoning yourself. You're going to die. Your fucking levels are way out of whack. Brian, my levels are way out of whack. I'll say Apparently, that's the only thing you're going to Oh, say. I, I didn't realize that was a full stop and well, transition. I'm, well, the, I, what, I what, saw, what effect is this having on you? I was giving you an opening okay, to well, contribute to the program. Well, here's my contribution. I saw a man on the news recently. He eats a Big Mac every day, and he has since like 1972. And then the weird thing is he also keeps the boxes. I've seen that guy. Yeah, he has like a ponytail, old gray hair. Yeah, but he, he's only eating the one Big Mac every day. He's not, he, that's not the only. Yeah. No, Morgan Spurlock went to, an, went to an extreme that no rational human being has ever done, which is McDonald's for every meal. Well, I mean, it, it, at some point in the eighties, I'm pretty sure I did Wendy's for five to six days at a time. Did they have a breakfast menu back then? Well, they did, but I was, I was never, you know, you would sleep through that period of time and you'd be leaving in a car around noon time. So you'd hit lunch, dinner, and late night, but you'd never, you'd never hit to breakfast. But did you desire breakfast? I mean, no matter what time you no, wake up. No, I was up, in bed of fucking sleep. I didn't get home till four o'clock in the morning. You only desire breakfast in the actual morning hours, like between 6 a.m. and 10 a.m.? You never they wake up? They don't fucking serve it. But I'm asking you what you wanted. No, if you gave me the choice at one o'clock in the afternoon of a goddamn giant, juicy, extra cheese triple dripping with grease or French toast, eggs and or eggs and fucking bacon, I'd take the triple. I take the eggs French and toast. bacon is either an early morning or mid morning food breakfast or potentially a, a late night uh, breakfast buffet, potentially at a Shoney's or something like that. Do they have Shoney's anymore? 
They must. I haven't heard about it going out of business. Well, you don't hear a lot of them crowing and turning cartwheels down in fucking Main Street because they're selling out either. Is Bob's Big Boy still around? Well, we never had Bob's. We had Frisch's Big Boy here. You had and a, then, boot, a bootleg Big Boy? Well, no, no, they were different big boys, the chains of big boys. Who? There was a different big boy out west, wasn't there? How big a boy was he? Jules Strongbow. Strongbow big boy. No, the, <laughs> the Bob's big boy, it was the same. The Frisch's big boy still had the goddamn checkered pants and the cow lick and the fucking, he was holding the tray up and everything, but it was in different parts of the country, they had different chains. And then I'll have you know, there was an outlaw big boy. It was the first fast food restaurant that I ever went to. It was a drive-in, of it, like a real drive-in, like on Happy Days where you drove up and you put the speaker or you talked in the speaker and they brought the tray out and hung it on your window and the whole nine yards. And that was where I gained my lifelong love of cheeseburgers and milkshakes for that matter. But it was Jerry's J-Boy. And they had a confusingly similar boy that was d doing the J. I don't know what the fuck, but Jerry's <laughs> J boy. And, and that was their big boy burger was the J boy. And when I was five, six, seven years old in the back seat with my mom and dad going over there and, and the thrill of talking into the, the speaker and somebody talking back to you. And then here comes the girl with the, tray and hangs it right there and you eat it in the car well you just couldn't beat that now there's a fucking shopping center over the top of where jerry's was and you can't get no more j-boys apparently there's one well as of 2021 there was one j-boys left and that was in paris kentucky well see paris gets all the good stuff i'm looking here bob's big boy bob's big boy began as bob's pantry in 1936 and then it became bob's and then bob's drive-ins and then Bob, oh, excuse me, Bob's home of the big boy hamburger. And then it commonly became known as Bob's Big Boy. But Big Boy what? Restaurants International, then known as Liggett Restaurant Enterprises, negotiated an agreement with other large franchise operator, well, with the other large franchise operator, Frisch's Restaurants. The big boy trademarks in Kentucky, Indiana, most of Ohio, and Tennessee transferred the Frisch's ownership. Uh-huh. So there you go. It was a territorial battle. Thank you, Funky Wagnalls, for that information. And actually, I'm, I'm calling an audible here. Wild card, bitches. Because I'm, move, I'm moving the format of this, this carefully orchestrated and controlled and overproduced program. I'm, I'm switching things around. Because I had an email I was going to read later. But now that you got me on the burgers... We might as well go for this, because this is I'm Adam from Edmonton, Canada. And I, I know Adam, he's a longtime member of the cult, but he wrote an email that I, can't, I just can't hardly believe it. Would you like to hear this? Why not? Hey there, Jim and Brian. This is from Adam. Jim, you being what I would call a cheeseburger wizard, are clearly an experienced diner when it comes to hamburgers and cheeseburgers across your great nation of the United States. So I needed to share my experience with you in hopes of opening up a discussion to help keep my friends in America food safe. Now, listen, listen to this, Brian, because you know he's from Canada. He's, he's got well, that... Based on what you said, yeah. I know that. Edmonton, I believe. Yes. So he says, being Canadian... I had the first opportunity to visit Chicago for a business trip recently. The first night I was there, I ordered a hamburger from the hotel restaurant. When I ordered the burger, the man on the phone asked me a perplexing question. How do you want it cooked? Now, Brian, if somebody asks you, when you a restaurant, room service, whatever, how do you want your burger cooked, what are you going to say? Medium. There you go. But... Adam continues, as a Canadian, this puzzled me. I stammered and said, the way you cook it regularly. He said, okay, medium. And then finished up with me and went to prepare my food. I remained somewhat confused. When I got my dinner, I'd been starving for 12 hours. And when I got the burger, I noticed a nicely browned and beautiful burger 
It better have looked beautiful for $35. That hotel room service after the pandemic apparently has gotten out of hand. But he says, as I took a bite and caught my first visual inside the patty, I noticed, well, it's still pink in the middle. The inside of the burger did resemble the medium cook you'd get with a steak. So being hungry, I finished the burger in record time, thought nothing of it, and went to bed. The next morning, I woke with terrible stomach pain <laughs> and was pretty much in bed most of the first evening I was in Chicago, which I immediately attributed to the pink burger. I'm going to explain this in a second for my American friends. Obviously, there's a bunch of people in Canada that are going, what's what's wrong here? <laughs> what's What's happening here? But he continues, now the locals I asked have said that it's customary to get your burger cooked medium in the United States. My eyes bulged open. In Canada, serving a burger with pink in the middle is against our food safety standards. Any burger you get in Canada is cooked through to well or well done at minimum. How could well done be the minimum? What's the next step up? Charcoal? <laughs> And he says, Pucky and, and, puck. Yes, puckish. He says, they don't just ask you, they just cook it that way as a standard. I was always explained the reason you could eat a steak blue is because the microbes are on the surface and kissing it to the grill will at least kill the surface microbes and you'll be fine. But when the beef is ground, the microbes end up inside the beef, with meat, which means it needs to be fully cooked through to kill them. Jim. I'd love to hear yours and Brian's thoughts on this simply from the standpoint of being the cheeseburger wizard. Is this customary? Why does he keep saying that? Where did he come up with this nickname? Well, apparently everybody knows more about cheeseburgers than poor old Adam. The wizard. But his final question, is this customary or was my hotel simply trying to kill me? Adam. They were trying to kill you. Jericho had just been there. They were done with people from Edmonton. <laughs> yeah, there you go. They were tired of people <laughs> screaming, hey, Derek, every time they were complaining about something. No, Adam, Adam, there's a difference between raw meat and a medium burger. And obviously, if you choose to do so, you can get your burger cooked medium well or well done or charcoal or what you can have it cooked to that point it, it'd be so dry you'd have to eat it in the rain but and and in fast food places they do the same thing every time there's no variation you're going to get what you're going to get but if you go to any restaurant of any quality past waffle house they're going to ask you how do you want your burger? Most people are going to say medium because then you got a little pink in the middle, but at the same time, you still got some juice. You got some flavor. You don't have to dunk it in a glass of water like Kobayashi does the goddamn hot dogs in the Nathan's contest. You think most people say medium? I would think. I think medium well. Oh, come on. I'm not saying it's what I pick. Then you're then you're getting you're getting way too close to it's fucking chili meat, as Ronnie West would say. Ronnie West smartened me up. He took a sabbatical from the wrestling business to go to work as a manager at a Wendy's down in Chattanooga. And he said once they have the burgers on the grill for so long that they were basically well done and drier than a nun's twat, as they say in the industry, uh, then they'd just break them up and put them into chili. It was chili meat. But nobody wants to eat a dry, wore-out fucking shoe sole burger. But the thing is, if if Adam was sidelined by a little pink in the middle of a room service burger, he must have lived in a plastic bubble for his entire life. Or what kind of immune system are you people working on up there in Canada? If you can't take a, a, not even a little E. coli, just maybe a little coli without the e from a little pink burger in the middle that ain't gonna hurt anybody you ought to see the goddamn variations imagine i've had room service burgers more than probably anybody listening to this you would and that's i think everybody would agree that's probably a certainty and they've been all over the page from burnt out and dried up to where jesus christ you'd have poor fucking sprite over the top of them all the way to almost raw in the middle. 
and then it's late at night, and they're already closed. You're lucky to get what you got by the time you got it, whatever the fuck. I'd just eat around the edges and leave the middle like a reverse donut hole. It, you got to do what you got to do. But a little yeah, goddamn pink so. burger meat never hurt anybody. I'm not saying go take a package of raw hamburger meat out of the freezer and, or the refrigerator and go to town, but good Lord. Pink burger. What's this world coming to when people can't take a pink burger? I'm agreeing with you. You really think most people would say medium well? I think so. I think anyone who's a child, no no children who's getting a hamburger in a nice restaurant is going to say medium. Their parent is going to say medium well. Well, here's the thing. There was no such thing as having a burger in a fine restaurant when I was a kid. But it has nothing to do with the question. By the time I was asked the fucking question, (laughs) I was a grown adult making my own decisions over the age of 18, and I said, medium, goddammit! Right away? No questions asked? No questions asked. They asked me a question. How do you want your burger? I told them. That was the question that was asked and answered. How do you want your steak? Medium rare. Medium rare? Wow. Medium rare. If it's a good one, if they know what they're doing, I don't want it to fucking moo at me when I stick the fork in it. I I don't say knock the horns off and bring it out on a leash, but I want some goddamn red and some juice running around. That was the way that my mother may have made her steaks, and they were quite delicious. All right, this has been, Re- you don't, this you has don't been Reggie's be- Corner. Hey, come on now. Oh, I'll tell you, they brought me the steak. I could still see the marks where the jockey was beating it. Um, speaking of being beaten, uh, we want to thank everybody last week that listened to the six-hour Jim Cornette experience. We don't know where this one's going to end up because we still got a lot more to go with all this wrestling. And um, and I, I the, the key word is listened to the experience last because I realized, you know, a lot of these podcasts they they do the the video, Brian, where you've got a static shot, possibly poorly lit, sometimes poorly framed, of somebody's giant bucket head talking into a microphone, and the other guy on the other side with his equally giant bucket head talking back to him or staring at the computer screen while he or staring at the screen this is yes. the other guy talk and while they're talking to each other and that i've been in both the television business and the radio business and that is rotten fucking television so we don't do rotten fucking television until we decide that and by the way i'm way too old for this so just fucking hold your breath and see how it works for you if you ever think this is going to happen until I decide we're going to do a fucking television show out of this where we're pitching to things and we've got video and we've got on location for something for people to look at besides my giant head up my hairy nostrils. There's no reason to do video because we are doing radio. Morning radio, evening radio, whatever time you want to listen to it, radio. We certainly have no discrimination against what time you want to listen to this particular program or any of the others, but it's easier to listen to while you're going about your day. Brian, you were telling me all the emails that we've been getting in of the people who say, well, I drive or I have to sit and look at this thing and I got to have something to listen to. Well, why would they want to look at our faces for hours at a time? Well, mine maybe, but certainly not yours. Well, it's I mean, just ridiculous. I'm the good looking one, but I Out agree. of who and who? See, the problem is some people started doing it and then everyone else just chases what someone does, thinking that that's the way to do it. But no one wants I'm... to stare at these big fat fucking heads. You know, every now and then it's like, oh, it's a celebrity. Someone I've seen on TV. What are they going to say? But after a while, you really have to focus on the audio content. And the other thing too is once you put a camera in front of people, it changes the show it changes the kind of show it changes what becomes a performance that doesn't interest me either i need to be able to do this but you have no idea you have no idea where it came from where did it come from or where it's going maybe you've come up with one reason we should do video if it'll keep you from doing that but otherwise damn it 
But yeah, it's it's easy because it, here's the thing: this wrestling. We talked about how much wrestling can we watch? How much of us can you listen to? More of us than you can watch wrestling because that requires, especially since most of the announcing these days is substandard. You got to actually watch that or try to. So I think we're ahead of the game. You can you can do two things at once when you're dealing with us over here. See, the other thing too is I grew up loving radio. And loving using my imagination to think about what's happening, what's going on. I like listening to baseball on the radio. I like good shows on the radio. And everyone gets away from that now. It's like one of the things killing radio. As soon as a show becomes big in sports radio, all right, let's do a simulcast. Let's film these guys talking on the radio. And it doesn't really help anything. It makes those guys some money. On the radio. Whoa, 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 on the radio. Jim and Brian were sitting on the radio telling us just how they felt. You know, when I was a kid, Brian, yes, I loved the shadow on radio and inner sanctum oh. and all of the various radio suspense and, oh, goddamn, what's the one that I, I was listening to this on Sirius when I was going to Florida all the time, and now the, um... The Whistler. I am the Whistler, and I know many things as I walk by night, and all that shit. But you'll say, Cornette, even you are not that old when you were a kid. No, I was, because Mama Cornette smartened me up when the local public radio station affiliated with the uh, Louisville Free Public Library started broadcasting all of the old radio plays from the 30s and 40s. And... We used to listen to some of those on, on the big console stereo that my dad had gotten from the newspaper back in 1965. It was an amazing... Uh, so, uh, yeah, so I had an appreciation for that stuff. I need to see you. I need to see Jim's reaction to the pay-per-view. No, you don't. Hey, it, unless you've ever wanted to watch somebody literally pull their pants down and take a shit right in their living room... I don't think you would have seen my reaction. He sounds so angry. I wish I could see it. That, that's what those are the comments. You need to do a video show so I could see this. <laughs> see what? We're sitting here. I'm sitting here. <laughs> I've, and, I'm still, and I'm telling you, I've done morning radio at radio stations. This is not a, a, a hyperbole at legitimate radio stations in various markets around the country. And none of those people at the time wanted to be on, they might have wanted to be on television, but not while they were doing their radio show. Because it would have gotten, because they're fucking, they dress like bums, they haven't shaved, they look like shit, there's shit strewn everywhere all over the fucking counters. I don't know what it's like now, but... Uh, See, the other problem is no one has figured out how to do audio on YouTube, and they're all rushing into YouTube and trying to get everything going on YouTube. What are they going to do? They're going to come up with a creative option? No. They're just going to film their fat fucking heads talking into the fucking camera. Just like everyone else. It'll look like everyone else's content. It'll feel like everyone else's content. But you know what? I th it, it, here's the thing. You know what I've realized now? I've talked myself into it. We got to do this. We've got to start doing it. But the thing is, we're going to do it completely differently. We're going to revolutionize it. We're going to shoot the backs of our heads. That's all you're going to see is the fucking back of your head talking to the back of my head, a close-up from the fucking hairline on the neck right to the my fucking headset bald spot on the crown, and we'll just... It'll look like Cousin It talking to fucking Cousin It. I'll film Swami. You won't know the difference. Well, actually, if you... How about we shaved, just do Dog the Dog? If you shaved Swami's ass and taught him to walk backwards, he'd look pretty much like you. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. But how about we just do an episode where we have Swami and... Harley Swami Quinn and Harley in front of no, the microphones. <laughs> people would people would fall in love with Harley. Be good for the numbers. All right. Speaking of of situations, I got to tell you this before we start with the bulk of the program. Um, uh, Hotchkiss Featherbottom, our own, our beloved Hotchkiss, was in the middle of a SWAT team standoff the other night. And serious? I haven't even told you about this. Yes. No, you have not told me about this. Because what happened, well, well, real briefly, several weeks ago when we got the 
Midnight Express figures in. I'm going to have an update on those here shortly. I mentioned that it displaced the feather bottoms because it filled up the storage unit and they had to move the porta potty out and the whole nine yards. Fanny got upset and they had to move out of the storage unit. Well, Hotchkiss decided to go ahead and get married to his longtime girlfriend, uh, Enchantra. Enchantra Featherbottom now is her name. They're, they're officially married. But Enchantra has done quite well for herself because she was an exotic dancer. And she made a lot of money because she was a, a big headliner, a star. As a matter of fact, there were 100 girls at the, the club that she worked at. She was the only one that was singled out. Everybody else, all of them were grouped together. It was right there in the yeah. It was right there in the tagline: "Deja Vu Strip Club, ninety nine beautiful girls and one ugly one." She was the only one that was singled out. This is the story you didn't tell me. Well, I'm just I'm prefacing by explaining that since they got married, Hotchkiss has moved into Ench uh, Enchantra's uh, subdivision house. Is what I'm trying. To, nice house and a nice brand new subdivision. Man, now they've got a nice place to live. And I've been over there, and it's lovely. It's over there in southern Indiana, and there's a farm in the back of it. And it's right off the side of a not even a busy street. They're two miles from a red light. It's just a road going through southern Indiana, and then there's this little subdivision with 20 or 30 of these nice brand-new houses, beautiful landscape yards, and I've been over there. You don't see... You don't even see an unbathed dog in this neighborhood. It is just quiet and peaceful, and the birds twinkle in the morning, and just lovely, right? He's only been there a short time, obviously. Well, suddenly, the other night, and by the way, this was on the WDRB News, and when I saw it that night, I'm like, holy shit, I wonder if that was near Hotchkiss near his neighborhood. Come to find out it was in his neighborhood. It was four houses down from him. And he wasn't on camera because he was hiding in the basement. But they had several of the neighbors' comments. I don't it, I don't know. It may be still be on their website if anybody wants to look it up. But <clears throat> SWAT team in Sellersburg, Indiana from WDRB. I think this was Wednesday. So what happens is he and his lovely bride we're sitting there, and suddenly they hear what they think. It might be like somebody setting off the cherry bombs or the firecrackers, and they're like, oh, this again, but pop, pop, pop. But then shortly afterwards, they see flashing lights. And apparently what's happened, I'll, I'll stooge off what is happening at this point that they found out a little bit later. Some woman that lives four houses down from them has come home drunk. Drunker than Cooter Brown, and has gone out or gone in the house and gotten her pistol, and has gone out on her deck in the back and is firing her gun off the back deck. And uh, yes, there's a farm back there, but it's in a subdivision. The house is fairly close together. And then somebody else may have seen that she's shooting it off her front deck. Now nobody knows what she was shooting at as of yet, because as soon as she starts shooting. Her teenage daughter runs out of the house and goes to the neighbors, and they call the police. So now Hotchkiss is looking at all these flashing lights as the police department comes screeching into the goddamn subdivision, and they're fucking pointing the spotlights on this woman's house, and she's in the house with the gun and has been firing shots, and they're on the loudspeaker this is the police department, come out, throw out the weapon, all the shit that they normally say on the goddamn loudspeaker, right? She ain't having any of this. She may have even potentially fired shots out of the house. Nobody knows exactly what the fuck at this point. So they, the normal police are not having any success with this. So somebody calls the SWAT team. And here comes a fleet of cops with rifles snipers positioning themselves at various points in people's front fucking yards, cops running through the backyard, they're seeing them, the shadows of them coming through and from the flashing lights through their windows as they're hunkered down. And here comes the goddamn SWAT team giant truck with a battering ram on the front of it. Into this fucking neighborhood. 
And they're screaming at this woman, come out. And this started at like 10 o'clock at night, and it's going on 2 a.m. in the morning. And finally, somehow, they, they're trying to enter the house through her garage. And apparently, she was of the belief, because by that point, how wouldn't you sober up after four hours? How drunk could she have been at 10 o'clock? That when the SWAT team is outside your house at 1.30 in the morning, you're still not sobered up enough to go, yeah, I think I can whip them. What the fuck? So they're trying to go through the garage, and old Hotchkiss and his lovely bride, they're hunkered down in their house, and they hear, bam! And then they hear, bam, 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 bam! And he said, well, she shot at them, and they shot her. And son of a bitch, wouldn't you know who won the pony? They're trying to go in her garage and she shoots at the SWAT team and then bam, 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 bam. Now she's not dead, but she, her, the threat had been neutralized. And Hotchkiss, he, he peeked up over the windowsill where he was cowering and he had seen where the, the cops were running toward the house, running toward the house. And after that, bam, 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 bam. The cops are all just walking slowly back away from the house. Like, okay, we're done here. And in here comes the ambulance. And they load in Calamity Jane, or Ma Barker. And off she goes. And that's made the uh, the local news that there she was not shooting. There was nobody in the house to fight with. She was just running around the house and outside shooting her gun at nobody. For no apparent, no apparent reason that anybody's been able to figure out. See, most of us, when we close our eyes, that's the way we picture life in Kentucky. Hey! Well, this is southern Indiana, so fuck you. How about that? Same difference. No, ho, oh, now them's fighting words. Now, you and I have never had a fucking argument, but if you try, <laughs> you just ask Travis Heckle what you've just done there. Is that where your favorite seafood place is? Uh, well, no, it's closed now. Clarksville Seafood, right next door to Sellersburg, but... The, the pandemic claimed that establishment, as well as other issues that we've talked about in the past. But anyway, that, that story may take um, a little bit of the pressure or the heat off of poor Hotchkiss because we have paused briefly and gotten an update. The Midnight Express 40th anniversary action figure set has been on sale now for one hour, and we've already got some feedback on Twitter that the site did not crash, ladies and gentlemen. There were a lot of people waiting, and there were only nine of the rocket launcher packages and only a hundred of the deluxe package that included the autographed 8x10 with Bobby's signature on it. And that's what everybody was standing in line for. And if you got an error message, it is because that those packages sold out so quickly by just the fact there were so many people trying to do it at the same time, by the time you hit your button, it was too late. Uh, the, but the site has stayed up, and the regular packages are continuing to sell. And an hour into this thing, out of the 2,000 packages, we are 600 down. So 1,400 left to go. Um, but I apologize to everybody who couldn't get in on the deluxe stuff, but there was a limited number for obvious reasons. And I hate that you got disappointed, but there still are the regular sets available with the, not only the box set of all four of our action figures, but also the full color 28 page book, the autographed photo of myself, Dennis and Stan. It can be personalized to your specifications and the certificate of authenticity. We still got some of those, but by the time we finish this podcast, the way things are going, I'm not sure. So jump in, and here was one more problem we had. Brian, I told you that we did not want to take, other pe take people's money on other items and hold it during this month pre-order period. And so we weren't, you were only going to be able to order the midnight set, but not any other of the merchandise in that same order. You could still order the merchandise separately. Well, apparently, Hotchkiss was not able to do that. 
uh, because it would require modifications to the store platform that we did not want to go into for this short a period of time. So temporarily, while we're handling the brunt of the midnight figure sales, you can't order anything else, T-shirts, DVDs, books, etc., whatever. And the reason we did that is because we knew this was going to be hectic, even for a staff that is now approaching half a dozen people. Uh, we want to make sure we get everybody's action figure sets out, and especially the international folks in time for the holidays. You can imagine that the time would have increased exponentially if we get flooded with 1,000 or 1,500, maybe 2,000 orders today, plus somebody wants a picture, and this guy wants a T-shirt. There's more combinations on my merchandise on my website than if you go to McDonald's and have it your way. So we, we, we didn't want to get in the weeds on that. So what we have done is we've taken the other merchandise down probably until we get a handle on the midnight sets and then we will put that back up for Christmas, if, if nothing else, by the start of next month for our Christmas season sale. But thank you, everybody, who is really jumping in on this thing. and. We apologize to anybody that couldn't get in numerically on the the deluxe packages. Oh me! But come I'm... back at Christmas time for the Frankenstein edition. Hey, where we, where we have the head of Bobby Eaton and the bandana of Dennis Condry and the legs of Stan Lane. <laughs> Come back at Christmas time for that. I wonder if I could sell like parts. If there was any <laughs> leftover part, here's a part of Stan. If people would have paid money for a part of Stan back in the old days. I've 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 seen a few uh of his spurned paramours in the past that uh were highly incensed they were not they were not allowed hey, to travel down that lane anymore. There is some video I had never seen before, but it just started going around and a bunch of people have sent it over. It's you in the Midnight Express on MTV. Yes. And Stan's outfit is what made me think of it, because he had giant shoulder pads and everything. <laughs> the look of well, the time, I guess. It was MTV in 1990. What, do you expect him to wear overalls? What the fuck? Stan was the gangster of love. It, it, he fit right in the fucking picture. What's the story and, with that appearance? Well, and also, what was the... Uh, that, uh, China Kantner, right? Grace Slick's daughter was the host. Yeah. And Paul Kantner's daughter. And, uh, well, uh, she was quite fond of sweet Stan. Um, oh. That was one of the few times that the TBS office, this was obviously after Turner had bought Crockett out, it was 1990, uh, that they actually got any of the talent on anything that any mainstream people watched, right? And I can't remember who was handling things at the time. Maybe it was Rob Garner. I can't even remember. No, it was probably after his time. But anyway, they called us one day and said, hey, I think it was potentially coming up on a show in the New York market, but they just got a guest spot on a wake on the wild side, which was the morning show on MTV. It was from like seven to nine o'clock or whatever in the morning, a wake on the wild side. And they said, we want you guys to be on it well, on MTV. Okay. MTV was still good. Then music television. And they flew us up there and drove us over there, and we went out and fucking did a wake on the wild side. I haven't seen the clip. I, I saw it being uh, sent around on Twitter, but I didn't actually have time to watch it. I haven't seen that thing probably since we did it. I have the VHS on my shelf here in the office, but I haven't watched it lately. It is funny to think about guest VJ Bobby Eaton. Well, that is Stan, actually, they had him introduce one of the hot Aerosmith videos at the time he did his DJ voice. <laughs> and then, like I said, China Kandner, I think if we, if me and Bobby hadn't been in the limo, she might have come with Stan after that. I don't, I don't know. I don't want to cast any aspersions on anybody. But yeah, we were awake on the wild side and then flew back home and did a spot show in fucking hoo-ha South Carolina somewhere. So that was... They didn't, really, we, they didn't try to set up anything else in the New York market just while you were here, a radio station or anything? I don't think on that trip. I don't, I, th th when we went to the new, when we went to New York before the bunkhouse stampede at the Nassau Coliseum, I think that's the time that Bill Apter took us around New York and took us to NBC and Radio City Music Hall and 
took pictures of us around the area and, and went to the PWI offices or London publishing offices or however it was termed. I think he he set us up for more New York area appearances than the company ever did. That's the one thing I miss about the days of the magazines all being in New York. Like George Napolitano, a wrestler, came into town. All of a sudden, the Road Warriors just walking around New York City. Yeah. And it's appealing to see these giant roided up guys walking around New York City without face paint. I love that stuff. See, I did the same thing, but down here it was like when, you know, handsome Jimmy Valiant at the Dyersburg, Tennessee County Fair or whatever. Uh, trying to win stuffed animals. Oh me! How big was it? If you walk, did you really walk around the fair with Jimmy Valiant? Oh yeah. How no, big? How big a deal was it for him to be walking around the fair? Oh, the the people went crazy. That was the thing. Is you know, with the spot shows in the summertime, a lot of them would be at fairs because they would buy the show. It'd be twenty five hundred dollars, three thousand dollars for a you know spot show that probably wouldn't draw that at the gate at five and six dollar tickets back in those days of some of these small towns and they'd send eight guys and a buddy wayne in his ring or whoever and do a show at the fair and there might be 500 or 700 or a thousand people at some of these fairs that would go and watch the matches but if the guys got there early you know handsome was always one to take pictures because the crazier his pictures the wilder the more on location shit he's doing wacky things you know handsome jimmy valiance as a baby face his gimmick then in in tennessee was you know like if if seth right if you could believe seth rollins was really on acid instead of just pretending badly and he was just a crazy guy they loved jimmy for that so one day we walk i have pictures of him with these giant stuffed bears and fucking shooting the goddamn water in the clown's mouth. And we'd go around to all the, the booths and all the rides, and he'd just take wacky pictures, and we'd sell hundreds of them on the fucking gimmick table. And all the kids would follow him around. He'd be like, whoo, must it, baby. You know, giving them the fucking shake fist thing. And they loved it. And then he'd go and have a match where he would tear the fucking, well, not the house down, we were outside, but he'd, the people go crazy, he might take fucking four bumps. I was going to say, did anyone ever, whenever you hear about people like coming up to wrestlers, like, I know it's fake, you're not tough, whatever it is, and then they get their ass kicked. Did anyone ever do that to Jimmy Valiant, or was he always just so ridiculous that it kind of diffused any situation <laughs> yeah, well, that happen? <laughs> well, I mean, here's the thing. It, not only, yes, that somewhat. Secondly, if you're in, you know... The Muhlenberg County Fair in fucking Central City, Kentucky, or whatever. The people, it's a TV star. They're coming up to ask for his autograph, or hey, or the guys are going, hey, handsome, whoo, mercy. They're doing his thing. And the kids think he's cool because he dances and plays his music on TV. And tough guys, he would be the last one that they would, you know, want to go pick a fight with to prove, not in his heel days. Or in the Valiant Brothers days, that was different. But at that time, with that gimmick, nobody's going to come up, hey, I want to kick your ass, prove wrestling's fake. He's like, oh, brother, come on, let's smoke a doobie. You know, he, <laughs> so that was, you know, Jimmy was bulletproof with that. And that's why he switched back and forth from heel to babyface, you know, so easily because he was a personality and it, that kind of thing got over. But nobody, now when the Valiant Brothers were hot, I'm sure they wanted to cut him. But speaking of wanting to stab somebody, apparently, uh, Brian, from what I'm being told from a member of the cult, uh, to some people at least, my visage is, uh, is tantamount to provocation to a fight. Have you, uh, I've, I've got to read this real quick. Well, actually, there's, there's two different viewpoints now on this. We got a lot of emails, and by the way, folks, yes, you've been emailing Reggie's Corner, and we've got some experiences live from the people that went to All In, and there's other things. We've, we're have deluged with emails, but we've been doing six-hour podcasts on all the goddamn wrestling, so we're going to try to catch up in the next few weeks, but real briefly, point-counterpoint on this, Paul from East Sussex, UK says, I decided to wear my corny face t-shirt to all in. 
Little did I know, little did he know, that it would have been more popular to have chosen an I Kill Puppies design. As I walked up Wembley Way, people pointed and shook their heads at me. <laughs> like, We're so sorry. I'm sorry you're having this experience. <laughs> just shaking their heads. Look at the state of him. Po- the pointing, it's, I think, is the worst part. Yes. Well, oh. <laughs> Ooh. Look. <laughs> He's being held up to public ridicule. He says one buck bitch even said that shouldn't be allowed. <laughs> Is that what they are now? Instead of the buckaroos, are they the buck bitches? That shouldn't be that. He, that I guess he pointed. He pointed and said, that shouldn't be allowed. Allowed. <laughs> <laughs> the show in general, he says, ranged from good to dumpster fire as expected. On the whole, it was little too sport. It was a little too sports entertainment for my liking. Listening to fellow Englishmen squealing in delight at hangnail and twinkle toes made me ashamed. But now that's that's Paul's hey, experience there. Go there ahead. was a twinkle toes McFinger bang sign that was pretty visible during the pay-per-view event. There there was, but I'm 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 thinking that may have been just a guy in, in the UK named Twinkle Toes McFinger Bang <laughs> was trying to take his fucking trademark back. A lone nut, not one of the cult members, that's what you're saying? No, I think he was Osgood Fingerbang's brother. Oh. And anyway, then from uh, what from Anthony, who just claims to be from the UK. He's he's a big man. He needs a big fucking hometown. Greetings, Jim and Brian. The apprehension of wearing my cornet face T-shirt at Wembley was considerable. On the internet, cornet fans often get tossed, bleeding and screaming between digital mobs. So I was worried that something similar could happen amongst 80,000 wrestling fans. I couldn't have been more wrong. I received a knowing smile with a pointed finger at Jim's face from a Bullet Club t-shirt wearer. A pair of Alohas from a couple decked out in acclaimed pink. Hey, all right. One guy in a CM Punk t-shirt grabbed me and (laughs) screamed, Twinkle Toes McFinger Bang in my ear, which I feel may have been complimentary. (laughs) Hold on, stop right there. I mean, just he was walking by and the guy just grabbed him and yelled this. He just grabbed him and screamed, Twinkle Toes McFinger Bang. He says, though my favorite encounter was with two pleasantly sozzled gentlemen who suggested I had balls of steel for wearing it and should rock it with pride. Well, there you go. And, and yeah, all right. what a day not to have those T-shirts on sale, but <laughs> you can get them soon, folks. Let's finish up on the uh, Midnight Express figures first. I think an important note that every fan base has their crazy fans, and we have a very big fan base that listens to this show. AEW obviously has a big fan base, and there are crazy fans attached to both. But there's also crossover, and there's a large audience that enjoys AEW or at least watches it that are Jim Cornette fans and I like hearing that second story I mean the first one's just ridiculous just the point the, <laughs> the, the, on Wembley Way of all places walking in on Wembley Way and how dare pointing. they desecrate Wembley Way <laughs> but uh but it's you know the second story I think is you know you see a lot of Cornette face t-shirts on these shows for a reason and it's not Jim Cornette listeners going there to antagonize other fans. It's listeners of the show that want to enjoy a night of wrestling. There's a crossover. And just think if they ever give them a night of wrestling that they can enjoy, how happy they'll be about it. You may get more of them at that point. There you go. See, it'll, it'll, it's, it's just a never ending cycle. You see, the problem <laughs> is the introduction now is the crisscrossing fingers and then. The other option is you may think the person pointing. What if the person pointing was actually coming in for a shake? <laughs> coming in with the pinky instead of the, because the index finger is the uh, accusational point, whereas the pinky finger outstretched would be the the brotherhood uh, offering. So it depends on depends on which finger you're getting. If the crowd's loud and you just see this guy and you don't hear the first things he's saying and you just hear, fuck you! You may not realize it's part of thank you, fuck you, 
Yeah. Or fuck them, excuse me. Yeah, or any, any variation of say this could start more fights than the soccer hooligans. Everybody needs to scream as loud as you can at the person that you're attempting to greet so they know what the greeting is rather than just picking it up in the middle. And See, that's what's puzzling about the Twinkle Toes McFinger Bang story. The guy just screamed it at him. That's not the greeting. That could be a, a false flag. That could be like someone who's infiltrated the group. <laughs> Well, I think I think the guy may have been sozzled before the other sozzled people that he saw. A lot of sozzling was going on at Wimbledon. That's probably why they enjoyed that show so much. There was a lot of sozzling happening. In the last week, we've had goozling and sozzling. Goozling and sozzling. Besides, they make the, the alcohol over there in the, the United Kingdom, they make that stuff in the bathtub over there, right? It's not like, you know, here in Kentucky, we have the bourbon industry. This stuff is aged... 15, 20, 20, 24 hours. Here in Kentucky, we have the bourbon industry and crazy women running out of their house with a gun just shooting into the air and anything they well, see. Well, <laughs> see, one, one goes hand in hand with the other. You can't. All right, well, speaking of people running around crazily, attacking people for no reason, let's update ourselves on what CM Punk has been doing these days. Um, apparently now... And Brian, you're going to have to fill me in on it because so much has been happening over here at the castle this week that uh, I've I've heard a little bit about this. I think you have some more detail, but now the story has become after we on what's your show's name? The drive through. That's it. Listen to it, folks. He needs the positive reinforcement. But after the drive through where we reported that Brian Alvarez has been made a public laughing stock and tied to the proverbial whipping post because he actually reported that punk and Miro almost got in a big fight when they were actually joking like hey you got a problem with me oh you want to take it outside about a bing bada boom and that became oh my god i talked to five people that said they were serious now punk or uncle dave brian's spiritual grandfather is now reporting that punk lunged at Tony Khan and was held back from apparently assaulting him and committing bodily mayhem and aggravated fucking treachery on Tony Khan's carcass after he dispatched Jungle Boy Jack Perry. And what What's the story here now? Well, it's an ever-changing story. Uh, depends on which reporter's reporting it, it seems like. But in this week's Wrestling Observer Newsletter, Dave compiled several versions of the story, including the one he was told. One person close to Punk who wasn't there, but <laughs> talked to him, said he tried to help a young guy and prevent him from doing something dangerous with Oh, this is going back to the previous thing. Excuse me. Well, look, we, we've, we've already established what happened between Perry and Punk, and that's not in dispute by anybody except potentially the... Cucamonga camp is that they were trying to talk Perry out of doing what he was trying to do and he wouldn't listen to anybody. And so finally, the, the people that were in charge, Tony Schiavone, the producer, etc., went to Punk and said, Hey, you're supposed to be the star around here. Can you get this fucking guy to goddamn quit fucking whining at us and just do what we asked him not to do? And that's what happened. And that led to Jungle Boy believing that his panties were being put in a bunch along with his fucking artistry being suppressed. So that's that was that incident. Nick Houseman essentially presented the punk side. He said punk was in gorilla since his match with Joe was next. Perry walked past him. Punk asked Perry if he had something to say, and the conversation escalated. The version from either punk or someone close to him but Dave's just flat out trying to figure out who that source is. <laughs> the version from either Punk or someone close to him said that Perry asked Punk to do something about it. That version was that Punk shoved Perry and Perry shoved back. Punk then grabbed Perry in a choke. This was reported by others as a guillotine choke. That's a front face lock for people who have been in the business longer than there's been a thing called MMA with the idea of holding him there to defuse the situation and that he didn't want to fight Perry and no punches were thrown as far as he knew. That version 
was that punk asked security if it would be better if he left the building and was told that nobody was going to ask him to leave, but it may be better if he did. And then you may remember Jimmy ordered Nando's for some of his friends who were the talent. Yes. The version that Perry told people... Cheeky Nando's! The version that Perry told people is that he was leaving after losing and got backstage. Punk came up to him with a lot of people around and said, Do we have a problem? Perry said no. (laughs) Perry then said to Punk that he said stuff that got online about him, and that line, using that term, cry me a river, it was noted that Perry probably didn't need to say the line during the match, but wrestlers do that all the time, whether to get their frustrations out or to pop friends in some form. Is this Dave speaking now, extrapolating on this? This is Dave explaining the Perry side in his own words, yes. Okay, because it's bogging down already. It would have been no big deal to anyone, except he should have known better because it was punk. The version Perry... He he should have known better because it was Charles Manson. And he was going to take offense at at fucking Terry Melcher not appreciating his music. The version Perry apparently said included that punk then said words to the effect of, You know I could fuck you up at any time, right? (laughs) That version was that he then pie-faced Perry and tried to put a guillotine on him and also threw some punches that were awkward from the position punk was not doing any damage. Oh, oh, and, well, and, and, oh well, not only the story is that <laughs> punk's just wailing on him, but that he's not doing any damage. While Perry grabbed punk's arm to try to keep him from locking in the move. <sighs> Samoa, so some, somebody gave Dave uh, the imagined play-by-play of this entire skirmish. If, if, if Most of the people who've been in these things can't remember exactly how they happened. Samoa Joe came in and quickly broke it up. Perry didn't have a bruise or scratch on him past those he got from the match. Brody King, who is tight with Punk, ended up being mad, and one version of the story told by many is that he punched a wall and may have broken his hand. (laughs) Although he claims differently. King, King did end up with a broken hand. I didn't know anything about this. Kid did end up breaking his hand but he said it was during the match. King King later claimed he never punched the wall, but he did kick a garbage can (laughs) and broke his hand during the match on the guardrail. However, other reports by those there have claimed to witness his punching the wall. Oh, for fuck's sake. (laughs) And the word in the dressing room was that he may have broken his hand or wrist hours before his match started. I don't see why he would make up a story, yet others have outright said that when people reported his story, they were being worked. So who knows? (laughs) It is possible that he punched the wall, (laughs) and people thought he broke his hand, and then actually broke it in the match, which would be quite the coincidence. And it is possible, with all the goings-on, people thought it was a punch when it was a kick. Security took punk. Can we get back to punk? <laughs> Hold on, I want to talk about Wallgate. God, no, I wait, want to talk wait. about Wallgate. <laughs> his goddamn <laughs> medical file and his primary care physician is not as thick as Dave's fucking extrapolation on how his his hand may have been damaged. I hope Brody King's career can overcome all this talk about whether or not he did indeed punch this wall or not. I don't know if he'll be allowed back in England. I wonder, did the wall sell? Security took Punk into his dressing room. Punk was then screaming at Khan and swearing at him. While this was going on, the announcers and production people were told to stall, because at this point no one knew if Punk vs. Joe was happening. Nobody, except those who saw the situation, knew why, only told to stall before the first match. Let me fast forward a little ahead. Okay, do, do you? I watched the pay per view. I got the pay per view from the start, not the zero hour countdown or whatever. But when the pay per view came on, they had the normal pyro, ballyhoo, wide shots, crowd. Now, whatever the fuck was there? Any goddamn was somebody out there twiddling their thumbs for five minutes waiting for the first match? According to the Wrestling Observer newsletter, Jim Ross was going to have a planned major entrance, and it didn't happen. Because of all this. If they were stalling, why would they have taken something out? 
Hello? I, I don't have an answer for that. I, I was trying to think of any logical answer to that. I maybe, don't know. Maybe JR didn't want to walk all the way from the fucking locker room to goddamn ringside and be blowed up at 72 years old with fucking leg cancer before he started the goddamn show. But why would you take something out if you were being told to stall? That makes no sense. Back to the Observer here. The belief is that Joe convinced Punk to have their match, and the show then went in the order it was originally scheduled to go. Another version, and this would be a neutral source, who was not a wrestler, but was there, and witnessed it, and his version was that right after Perry came to the back, Punk went nose-to-nose with him aggressively, and asked if he had a problem. That person said Perry said he was just looking to get heat as a heel. (sighs) <sighs> Punk shoved him hard. Perry got in his face, and in that version, Punk sucker punched him and went for a choke. People immediately broke it up, and Khan was yelling at Punk to let him go. That person said that once they were separated, Punk lunged in Khan's direction, <laughs> but a number of people got in his he way. Said, he said, Khan! And a number of people got in his way while Punk was yelling, I quit! Monitors were knocked down during all this. Joe was very upset and went to calm Punk down. Well, let's uh, stop there. What do you think about him lunging at Tony Khan? Yeah, I think a lot of this comes from almost nobody involved in this equation actually knowing what legitimate aggressive behavior is. They think that if you look at somebody with a stern face and say, fuck you, that's aggressive. I don't think they understand what the fuck they're looking at. And secondly, Tony Khan talking about an investigation. Apparently, he was standing right in front of it. Did he need a magnifying glass to investigate that? He, if he was involved in the room when it happened? He was standing first, in front of it, and there's a video of it, apparently. Apparently, as we've been told, there's video because there's security cameras all over Wembley. They're down Wembley Way. And also, yes, I can believe pieces of all of this. I can believe that the whiny little fucking bitch, Jack Perry thought that, as we've said, he was going to mouth off on TV and get his vent his spleen on what poor, you know, the, the, the poor beleaguering that he'd gotten from fucking punk for not doing his glass spot. And we can believe that when he came back through, punk said, do we have a problem? Where it gets sideways is, I would think, and I would believe more of the, what are you going to do about it? than either, I was just saying something to get heat. Although, actually, I was just saying something to get heat is probably another goddamn heat passive from who? aggressive thing that they'd say. But it, well, that's because they heat from who? That doesn't get heat, heat from, from the who? Fans. Nobody, un- nobody would understand except the guy that you're trying to piss off. And it doesn't make any sense in storyline or context or anything else. So he was saying it directly to him, but then passive aggressive. He'd say, "I was just trying to get heat." Do I believe that Punk just started fucking punching him? No, because the testimony there from, you know, Pope Dave was that he didn't have a scratch on him. And I don't care, you know, Jesus Christ, whether Punk won or lost his fights in the UFC, would put Jack Perry in that fucking position and see what would have happened. The point is, if there was the shove-shove and whoever shoved who first, Punk front face locked him, which is what you do to neutralize the situation. And then I could also believe that Punk was saying, I quit. Like, what the fuck? How much more do I have to put up with from these fucking children and these fucking backstabbers and these fucking connivers and these fucking pussies that can't even fucking come out and get in my fucking face? They got to do it on camera on zero hour. Or they got called Dave and his little lab dog, Brian. Hey, listen, a mid-card guy gets away with doing that on TV because they know the boss isn't going to do anything about it. Exactly, because everybody can get away with it because they know the boss isn't going to do anything about it. And I, again, I reflect back on CM Punk worked in the WWE for 10 fucking years. 
and and a, a fuller schedule than he is now. And I don't recall any lawsuits, locker room brawls, investigations, suspensions, whatever the fuck. But he's been in this fucking romper room for two years part-time. He's already been in a half dozen of them. What's the the common factor is he ain't putting up with any shit as it relates to shit coming his way and nobody at the top is doing anything about it. In his previous place of employment, if there was any shit coming up, it didn't bubble over till it came out like that, either in public until the end, in public or physically, because there was a fucking boss doing something about it. In this case, you have a boss doing nothing about it. You have a top talent who the network likes, who is paid a, like the top talent that he is. Who is being run off by the executive vice presidents of the company and their associated stooge minions that are swinging on their dicks and riding the flying squirrel of their nutsack. And I believe he's still their biggest merch mover, too. And then uh, uh, here's another thing. Who are the people giving Dave and Brian these play-by-plays and how much more veracity is, the, is there in Dave's latest one than there was in Alvarez's Tween Punk and Miro? Well, here's the other thing. I'm not saying this is all a stooge test, but it may have become that. If you're Punk and Miro, Brody King seems to have been busy with a wall in the back, but if you're Punk and Miro and this is happening... And now Dave's saying, one person who's not a wrestler who saw this told me this. Alvarez is saying, five people were witnesses who told me this. How many people were there? At a certain point, maybe you're figuring out who the problems are. Reporter, reporter, can you tell me a lie? You're going to find, you're gonna find out the source is Tony. That's the problem. <laughs> That's the problem. And he's telling them different stories depending on who the last person is he talked to. He loves the drama. Because he believes everything. And he loves the drama. Even, again, recently he did an interview saying that he doesn't think it's necessarily a problem when your locker room doesn't get along. But he doesn't love the drama if he's in it because he won't be dramatic with anybody. He, if, he doesn't want anybody to be mad at him. We've heard over and over. He won't talk to anybody if he has bad news for him, either to fire him or a fucking... He's never told anybody they were suspended personally, as far as I am aware. Wasn't that all handled through legal? Does he ever tell anybody bad news? Does he ever say no? Tell him no, 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 no. Once again, the zombies, ladies and gentlemen. Colin Blumstone, Rod Argent, the other guy with the glasses. <laughs> Rod Argent. Whatever happened to him? He then did the band Argent. Well, I know that. Hold your head up. Well, the other song was God Gave Rock and Roll to You, which later Kiss covered for, I think, the uh, soundtrack of Bill and Ted 2. But that but band... then Argent was gone. But then Argent went away. I actually saw the zombies. They had a reu... Well, they are still reunited, but they had a their first reunion tour. They did some small venues, and uh, there was an industry function in New York City. I got to see them. Are they still losing body parts whenever they walk down the street? No, they actually have remarkable heads of hair uh, and uh, hmm. sound pretty good. Brains. Not those zombies. Not the Sven zombies. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, Sven can carry a, a decent tune when he's got Freddy Boom Boom Cannon on his side. What about that? You know, you've talked in the past about stooge tests. Could something become a stooge test inadvertently? Possibly if, if, if the person who knows what the real story was then was to make up a story and only tell it to one person and that story then got out and was repeated, then that person that was told that story flunked the stooge test. And there could be one of these floating around in there somewhere because how many different stories can we get? And generally, the wilder ones and or the ones that Uncle Dave puts all the flowery language in and the supposition and the assumption and all the rest of that stuff, 
they're they're a little bit ridiculous rather than the simple version which hey you got a problem with me yeah what are you gonna do about it ah here you go that's what i'm gonna do about it that's generally the way it happens i got some breaking news here dave Meltzer reporting after the incident where he lunged at tony khan (laughs) cm punk was seen in catering where he cut the line and lunged at a salad (laughs) he's out of control this cm punk and I understand that later on he was seen throwing puppies off the roof of Wembley Stadium. He must be stopped. He CM must Punk. be stopped <laughs> at all costs. All right. Well, that was oh. abrupt, but we are in the future. I know, and boy, it really, it hurts when you take the special energy pack out. Uh, Are you sure you couldn't have constructed that time machine a little bit differently where it didn't have the anal insertion probe that uh, has the transmogrifier Bemis? You know, some people pay extra for that. Well, I'm in some South American countries, but folks, we have traveled through time uh, it, not even inadvertently, but unexpectedly, because we were just speaking, at least on the air as far as you know in this podcast, that we're trying to fucking do. My God, I'm going to beat my head against the fucking wall. Hey, God damn. Anyway, we were trying to do this podcast. We were talking about CM Punk lunging, or the potential lunge, or lunges, or who had lungs enough to lunge. And suddenly we were hit with news and we had to stop down and investigate that. And then we had to record the special edition of the program, the breaking news bulletin update that immediately went out on YouTube and also on our our feed. Right, We're not off our feed. We're back on our feed, right, with that thing also. Is that the case? On our feed or on our feed? What are you... On our feed. It went out on our feed. It's on the feed. So they got fed, the people, the cult of Cornette got fed before they're going to get fed this feed. That's what I'm trying. They got fed that feed before they're getting fed this feed. It was a surprise feed. It was a force feed. It was a force feed. <laughs> they were force fed this feed. And now we're back trying to finish this program after we've done that breaking news bulletin because Punk will no longer be lunging at Tony Khan. Tony Khan citing that he was in fear of his life the other night. Play that sound effect now. The screaming Wait a minute. Hold on. This is Tony (laughs) Khan seeing CM Punk lunge. (laughs) Tony Khan announced that he was in fear of his life when, when Punk went on his rampage backstage at Wembley Stadium. And right immediately after CM Punk went out and wrestled his match with Samoa Joe as scheduled and came back and posed for pictures with people in the locker room and got showered and got changed and dressed and went back to the hotel and ordered Nando's for some of his co-workers and got on a plane and came back to the United States of America and went to his home, apparently, where he's, I I hope, quite comfortable all week. Tony fired him! (laughs) Where I hope he's quite comfortable all week. What? Well, I don't know what he's been doing all week. I hope he's been comfortable. A long trip like that. <laughs> having to front face lock a child and then fight Samoa Joe. That's that's rough on your body. But after that, immediately, right after all those things happened, Tony decided by the uh, the unanimous recommendation of the Oh, God, what? The AEW Discipline Committee. The Discipline Committee. Not even the Disciplinary Committee, but the Discipline Committee that we're finding out that exists now. It's like his booking. It sounds like it comes from Germany. Something that, well, as a matter of fact, I think I've seen that series of videos. You will meet before Uh, the Discipline Committee at once. Yes, and boy, they were dressed to the nines. But uh, uh, we find out these things exist on the planet immediately before they are come into play in his booking and in his company uh, uh, management as well. But at any rate, if you want folks, go to the, if you haven't heard this, and in your spare time, in between backstage locker room fights or, you know, getting fired or suspended or whatever, if you want to go to YouTube, 
You can look that up or you can get it on the podcast feed, either one. What's the title of the piece? On YouTube, I believe it's Jim Cornette on CM Punk being fired by AEW. Well, that that's pretty self-explanatory, I guess. So it's it's a long one. We're not going to repeat. We're not going to chew our food twice here. But that's what we've been doing, and now we're back on this show, and we're going to try to review all the oh. wrestling that happened after this earth-shaking incident from from both companies. Um, and also, you know, folks, we got to be honest. There's a limit to human endurance. We've heard Gordon Soley say that 40 years ago, and it's never been more obvious to me and Brian last that we've watched all this wrestling and recorded all this audio. So if we are not as chipper and perky as we normally are for the rest of this program, this is like one of those old time radio marathons. Remember we're for charity or some fundraising good cause. The DJ would be on the air for like 96 hours straight until he had a brain aneurysm and they pulled him out by his feet out of the, the booth. It's kind of like what this is now, isn't it? Except he didn't have to watch wrestling back then. You know, there always is the option of firing up the time machine and going to drive through episode 313 and guess the program. Well, but then we'd, we'd be leaving the people hanging here. As Tracy Smothers would say, don't leave the people hanging. But we wouldn't be here. We would know we would be in the future. Well, but then somebody would remember because they didn't get to time travel with us and they would find us in the future and get even with us. Stephen so we gotta we gotta make sure we cover our ass here and do the rest of this program. But I'll I'll tell you what. Would you ever have thought? Would you have bet a million dollar a mil one million dollars, Brian, that Tony Khan, the first time he would have shown any gumption, would be to fire his biggest star, not even Perry, the little the little waggy mouthy little. Yip yap dog that started the whole thing, but his biggest star. Would you have bet a million dollars on that, or even a billion dollars? Uh, possibly, because I think Tony wants to be popular, and CM Punk became the most unpopular kid in school, and Tony increased his popularity, even though he was friends with the unpopular kid, by getting rid of the unpopular kid. Well, but now you know who's unpopular is his boys, the Buckaroos. They got booed out of the building in Chicago. Uh, uh. At the pay-per-view, after everybody heard this this news, so I'm thinking what we need to do is we need to start some some betting, some wagering on who's going to be next to be fired because they're just just the shits. That's what we ought to do because you know NFL season is coming up. You know our friends at DraftKings take a lot of these bets, right? The the NFL season is coming up. They're taking bets on the NFL and. I assume because they're the official partner of the NFL, they've, they've obviously got some kind of inside hookup there. So they, that's, that's an official pipeline. I wonder if they could be the official partner of AEW and I we could start. They, I think they are. <laughs> well, uh, good. Then we could start taking bets on who gets fired for being an unprofessional prick next. Well, I don't know if they take those bets, but I believe that's the official partner of AEW, they do other AEW. Well, see there, they, well, see AEW, they, they ride our coattails all the time. Well, they were, and they, were and they, the they, they, imi they, were they imitate everything that we do. So naturally we get a big time spot sp sponsor like DraftKings. And then they start trying to emulate us. I can see that because DraftKings is hooking everybody up this NFL season. Have you heard about this? Have you read about this? I heard $200. about this. You're going to get $200 in bonus bets instantly when you bet just $5 on any NFL game. And I don't see how you can't, you can't hardly not go wrong with that, can you? Can't hardly not. You can't hardly no. not go wrong with that. No. All you've got to do is bet $5. Now this for is for week one, this week. I guess it's this week. It says, first it says week one, and this is this week. Is NFL starting this week? Week one. Week one, God damn it! then you're going to win this week <laughs> because new customers. <laughs> what? I, I, just I don't even know what you said. You're going to win this week? <laughs> well, you're already going to have won this week. See, it's already in the bag. That's why I'm using the past tense on win, even though it hadn't happened yet, because this is as good as gold, folks. Time machine. If you're a new customer of DraftKings, 
you can get $200 in bonus bets instantly when you bet just $5 on any NFL game. Any NFL game of any kind, even with those Jacksonville Jaguars. DraftKings is hooking everybody up with game day greatness, and all customers, whether you're new, old, young, poor, rich, whatever, you can take advantage of two new offers every single game day this September. I don't know what those offers are because you got to check the app to see what's going on, apparently. Because the fucking copy ends with no period and half a word. But right now, <laughs> if you download the DraftKings... What are you laughing at? You! <laughs> the fuck? If you'll right now, if you'll download the DraftKings Sportsbook app... Yeah. Yes, app. That's Is that short for application? It is, yes. Well, there you go. See, I'll, you learn something every day. If you download that right now, and all of you people out there, you know how to do it, then new customers can take home $200 in bonus bets instantly for the $5. That's if you use the code of JCE. See, that stands for Jim Cornette Experience. That's the way we they know we sent you. JCE is the code. $200 in bonus bets instantly for betting $5. Remember, everybody gets those special offers. Except me, I didn't get that whole line of copy. But right now, it's only on DraftKings Sportsbook. That's an official sports betting partner of the NFL and potentially AEW. We don't know if they're claiming them. They mention them not in the material I'm reading here. DraftKings Sportsbook, the crown is yours. And there's additional information. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY, parenthetically, 46739. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly, or at least legally, morally, and ethically. Responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas, 21 plus age varies by jurisdiction, void in Ontario. They certainly are. C C D K N G dot co slash football. <laughs> For eligibility terms and responsible gaming resources, bonus bets expire seven days at issuance. Eligibility and deposit restrictions will apply. I said C. C C D K N G A. <laughs> C. What you have bet? Oh, C. All righty. Well, you just DraftKings. Yeah, DraftKings. What? Why is everybody in Ontario void? No, the offer is that, is that void of thought, void of no. The offer is void. They're not voidoids up there, like uh, Richard Hell and the voidoids. They're just in a void jurisdiction. Well, they ought to do something about that. The it people seems in like Ontario, they could, they could pay the bill and they could turn their their void back on or something. All right, uh, should we talk about? Let's get the WWE portion of the program out of the way. The the biggest company in the world. It doesn't make nearly as much news as these fucking wild ragamuffins over on the other side of the street. Uh, but they they had some more programs this week. Should we talk about that briefly? Yes, I guess so. I mean, the time machine again is the other option. Well, I, I, let's go. Let's go through this just so we don't cause our future selves any problems, especially if we show up wearing raggedy clothes and potentially having been addicted to drugs like Stan's future self. What? You don't, I forgot, you don't watch South Park. I thought you were talking about Stan Lane. Is there something no. I don't know about that you guys did some fantasy Stan booking? Marsh. <laughs> or Stan Lane got sake. hooked on drugs in the future. No, no, no. That's, <laughs> that's where they opened the service. And Dennis became see. president. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, <laughs> President Condry? Dun, 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 dun. He would give the uh, opening uh, State of the Union address with a full Nelson face buster. But no, they they sent the, they started the business where they were sending 
delinquent looking individuals around to the various children in South Park claiming to be from a time machine and they are them from the future seeking to come back and, and, and show these kids not to lead lives of dissipation and debauchery that would lead to them being ragamuffins and cretins off the street such as this guy from the future. But the future selves turned out the kids got smart to it and then basically wreaked havoc on their parents. And I think uh, one set of parents may have been killed inadvertently. All right, anyway, now we'll go back to SmackDown on September 1st, the opening of the Labor Day weekend. And they were not, by the way, Brian, in the Hershey Park Arena. This is the new building. It's not the old, like, as Bulldog would say, ah, oh, the fucking shithole Hershey Park. It's a new place they've got now. The cult members had written me last time we asked that muse, or that, <laughs> that muse, that question. <laughs> Because I looked down at my notes and I, I wrote music, Cena, exclamation point. And the fans lost their fucking minds. Here comes John Cena. And I believe they've announced, what is he going to be around for, uh, what they say, seven weeks of, of television? Seven straight weeks, yes. And what to what do we attribute this this good fortune? Did they say, or just it's a, well, what the fuck? Do they still do the... The sweeps, the rating sweeps, September, Well, new the, season. The other thing to think about is, of course, they did promote the fact, uh, and nothing against this, I think it's wonderful that he's going to do Make-A-Wish in every single town that he's in. That's wonderful. Oh, excellent. It's one of the best things about John Cena. But I have to wonder if, due to the Hollywood strike, the writers and uh, the actors going on strike as well, I'm guessing that kind of killed a lot of his projects, whatever was... About to be worked on, and he probably... What are you could... saying? He needs the money? No, but I'm saying he knows he has seven weeks. He could do something. He can go do Make-A-Wish in seven different towns. He's not working a full schedule. He's not doing the house shows. Are there house I... shows? I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm just... I'm fucking with you anyway. But I don't think he needs the money, but it's nice. So they've got him for seven weeks, and he's going to do the Make-A-Wishes. Yeah, I don't think it's about the money. And, uh, and he's going to India. Apparently, he said that. That's about the money. I think that's about the money. That, that's probably about the money. <laughs> I hope to God he doesn't... The food and the water apparently is what nearly killed William Regal and sickened like two dozen of the boys when they went over there 25 years ago. And I'm, I, I'm not trying to insult any of our fans that may be living in the country of India, but apparently y'all have shit in your systems that we don't have in ours and it doesn't take kindly to intruders or whatever i don't know how that works apparently they're used to whatever they drink and eat over there and i'm not talking about spicy shit giving you the runs i'm talking about like deathly fucking intestinal parasites but nevertheless good luck uh, john cena good luck john <laughs> knock him out john uh so he's also announces he's going to be the host of payback parenthetically, is hell, daddy. Uh, tomorrow night on the fine cock network and all the other places they're showing it. And then Uso music plays. And here comes Jimmy. So now they got John in the bloodline deal, which you would figure, top angle. And he, of course, asked Cena, what are you doing here? The people came to see me. And they want to know why, Jimmy, why? And then he started telling the story, and I'm not going to go into granular detail on a lot of this stuff this week but he did it because he loves his brother and he didn't want jay corrupted like roman reigns or john cena either one and he made fun of cena's clothes and you know you you guys just take and take and finally you know john bowed back up at him verbally and ended up with telling him you know what here's the problem the wrong uso quit and as he goes to walk off, Jimmy goes super kick him. J John catches it, lifts him up, gives him the attitude adjustment. Boy, he does get some nice air on that one when he boosts the guys up. And boom, one move, and he... Well, you're snickering already. He also used to get a lot of air on that STF he would do, where he would have a cross face on the guy where his hands were nowhere near the guy. His hands would be well, locked 
a foot in front of the guy's face. I don't know what he was locked. Well, he didn't he didn't want to cover up the guy's face when they were facing the hard camera, so they could get a good close up. But any but yeah, boom. And one move and he leaves and there we go. So uh, again, this was a bonus for these people because they bought tickets two months ago or whenever, not thinking they were going to see John Cena, so they lost their rabbit ass minds. Um, what'd you think? Nothing too much more I could add to that, but I think you're right in general about whether it's AEW or WWE, we're seeing a lot of cases where people just want to pop for their guys or see the person they've always wanted to see. It really doesn't matter what they do. And uh, unfortunately, that's um, that's getting more and more prevalent is the and they're, the WWE is feeding off of it. They figure as long as we send the guy out that you want to see and he just talks or even does his entrance or whatever, that's the biggest part of it. We don't need to go any further. <laughs> anyway, uh, what did you think of Rey Mysterio and Pablo Escobar against Grayson Waller and our boy Austin Theory? Uh, I was hoping you wouldn't ask me about this match. I mean, it was all right. It got killed by the commercial break, so it was hard for me to really get into it at all. I swear to God, that's what I was going They, you know, Ray opens up strong and did a dive, and they went to, like, a sudden break, almost like I was expecting to see the fucking news bullet. We interrupt this program to bring you a special announcement because they're in the middle of something, and it just went to black in a minute and a half. And they came back and were getting heat on Ray and not much was happening. And there was a cold tag. And then Escobar did a big comeback. He's really working for this spot, right? False finish, four-way. And Waller finally just hit his finish on Escobar, one, two, three. And Escobar had saved Ray Mysterio from, from that fate. And there was nothing wrong with it. It's just there wasn't much there, and it wasn't much good. It was all about that. It was all about Escobar saving Ray. Yes. You sat through those commercials for that. You you basically sat through the entrances and the match and the commercials and everything. For uh, Bobby Lashley in the ring in a nice suit. And uh, everybody, according to him, is asking the same thing. What's going on with you and the Street Profits? Where's MVP and why isn't he managing you anymore? Yes, where is Cedric and Shelton and what happened to the Hurt Business? Why have they recast it? And, but basically, Bobby's story is that real recognizes real and great recognizes great. And the Profits music plays and here they come in their suits and boy, they do look dapper. They're very well dressed and everybody hugged. And it looks like they're all baby faces. And then, do you even remember the Street Profits promo or what they said? Or, well, or do they, you they remember teased, how it struck you? They teased that they were going to turn on Lashley, which immediately struck me as I've seen this angle before on this with Edge and Judgment Day, let alone other things. But then they didn't do that. Well, but, it, and that was the, there was a, a brief tease of that in the line, but also from the start and from the finish, their promos are annoying and heelish, <laughs> Ford especially, whatever the fuck his concept is he's going for, he's, I don't know why he talks like that. But it, it, it they were presented as babyface, people were cheering them, they haven't really done anything wrong. And and Bobby spoke like that, and then they come out and try to see if they can be as annoying as they can fucking be. But that's where they say, "But we, Bobby, we got two words for you," and it was rumble, rumble, rumble. Oh, oh, thank you. And then Lashley says, "We're putting everybody on notice. We're coming for power, control, and gold." So. I wrote here, are, is Bobby a baby face and the uh, street profits are going to be heels or are they just really fucking annoying baby faces? And then I got no answer from the, the page I wrote that on either. Is Bobby Lashley a baby face or a heel? Well, he certainly comes out there and smiles and hadn't said anything out of the way. 
And because uh, the, they, they all seem heelish to me, even though Bobby was a baby face right before this. Well, I was about to say they switched him a while back and then I, I, he's been back and forth. Anyway. So what happened? Oh, and then as they're walking past, as they're leaving the ring, here comes Sammy and Owens and they come out with the tag team belts and they have a confrontation in the aisle, not a confrontation, but like they're face to face and the street prophets invite them to pass on in a friendly manner. So we don't know what the fuck's going on. And here's somebody else I thought were baby faces. Escobar's stooges in the LWO. Are they not baby faces now? Yeah, of course, the LWO are a baby face faction. Then why did Sammy and Kevin beat them in two minutes? One tackle pancake, one, two, three. It was a tag team eliminator match. It was a tag team burial match. They come up with a... At least if you're a heel, you got it coming and you can bitch a little. But when you're a babyface team and the babyface tag team champions just beat you one, two, three in two minutes. Oh, well, that's that part is. of the problem with the LWO. They come out there, Rey Mysterio's over and he's a legend. Zelina Vega's over. She's been there a while. Escobar's getting there and the fans are accepting of him. And like you said, he's working hard. The two guys that came with Escobar, nothing against them, but the way they've been presented. They were just two guys in the background. They have no, the nothing about them that stands out. So, I mean, it's a great example of how WWE must think of them. If they use, like you said, the babyface tag team to lose to the top babyface tag team. Well, they're the uh, babyface version of Imperium, Gunther Stooges. At least they're, they're bigger and they can, they're heels so they can get away with it better. So, you know, AJ Styles is really pissed off at Jimmy Uso for being rude to Mia Yim in the back earlier. I didn't mention that because I didn't care. But then Solo leveled AJ and fucking just knocked the shit out of him back there. And then Solo told Jimmy, all these, got to keep track of who's mad at who this week. Solo told Jimmy that he's out of the bloodline when they say he's out of the bloodline, and, and apparently they ain't said yet. And Jimmy told Solo off and walked out. So they're just... And then when they came back, AJ was even further pissed and wanted Solo to, I know you'll never believe this, for tonight. So we got that going for us. Here was the segment of the program. Notice I said the segment of the program because so far we got nothing. Miz and L.A. Knight again. The Miz is growing on me. Kind of like fungus on the bottom of a shower curtain. You know, I know this is the most you've watched of like him doing something in a row. Usually like you watch maybe one thing with him because it involves other people and then you fast forward through his stuff for weeks at a time. <laughs> and he's involved in a lot of stupid shit, but he's being used here in a way that he's involved with someone who's on the way up, and I'm glad you're giving this stuff a chance. Well, and here's the thing. It didn't take long to watch his shit the past several months when he was getting beat by everybody in two minutes, so, you know, I got used to that's what's happening. But if he does the brief promo, and they're talking about their match at Payback, but the, here comes L.A. Knight, and he gets the big pop again and the chance, and he cut the promo on Miz's impersonations. And you know what they're doing that's working, I think, is there where you would what somebody in a promo with L.A. Knight, they're yelling him. And this may work for him. if he Because he's got him yelling already when he's running him into the fucking desk head first, blah, blah, blah. We've heard from a lot of listeners who have gone to shows AEW and WWE. They say people are yang all throughout the building the whole night. <laughs> it's caught on. Well, and hey, so did malaria. But, you know, we'll go with what's working. But anyway, um, the promo is Miz is a wannabe, and he worked hard to get there, and Miz walked in off a reality show. You want a game show, mother? So Miz fired back up with all of his accomplishments and L.A. Knight said the star of Miz and Mrs. was Mrs. 
And there was a perfect opportunity here. And if I believe I know that L.A. Knight is clever enough, he thought of it and probably pitched it and they wouldn't let him say it. But he was telling Miz that if your wife has an empty feeling inside after your loss to me, she can call me to fix it. She sh he should have said if she's feeling empty after your loss to me, she can call me to fill her up. But I bet you they wouldn't fucking let him get by with it. Anyway. <laughs> Okay. What? Okay, you seem to be really, uh, you think he would have gone for that long. God, oh, I had a heartbeat. Are you out of your fucking mind? That was laying right there in front of him on a platter? Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, um, Miz says he's going to crush his hopes and dreams and send him back to 2003, and L.A. Knight fired up strong, and then inevitably, as these things do happen, Miz swung... <laughs> And, du and L.A. Knight ducked and ripped his jacket off and did a nice stagger to throw it away and turned around into the fucking full Nelson Dennis Condry face buster. And boom, and Miz rolls out, and he's leaving like, fuck you. And L.A. Knight gets up and gets back on him, and that's when the referees come to pull him apart and everything. And that was a good segment, especially when everybody's laid out with one move, and then the other guy walks off for five minutes. It was nice to see L.A. Knight come back, and and they got in another skirmish that had to be separated by authority figures. But that was a good set. That was the best segment on the program. Those two have had a few great segments now, or good segments. I don't want to say great, but really good segments, and I think a few of them have been the best on the program they were on. They've kind of been doing Raw and SmackDown. Miz is really good. His facial expressions are great, too. L.A. Knight, I was impressed where at one point he lost it. Whatever he was trying to say, he lost the phrasing, and he started the, the, stumbling. The, 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 uh, pay the pay line. Shop. The pay line, or I think he called it at the end. He lost his phrasing, and then he recovered, and I was impressed by that. Yeah. Well, and, and, and you could see him start to chuckle, like, oh, goddamn, I'm going to go down in flames over payday launch, <laughs> payday <laughs> loans shop, and then he got it. See, I can't say it either now. Uh, but, it, but yes, uh, we give him applause uh, on that one. All right, Bailey wrestled Shotzi. I know everybody's happy to hear that. And uh, then the main event on the program, as we mentioned before, was AJ Styles and Solo. And again, AJ Styles is a, a, a wonderful performer, and Solo is better than his experience level indicates that he probably should be. But he's he's not a a normal style worker, and he shouldn't be. I'm not advocating that. Um, he's he's a punch and kick, chop meat kind of straight ahead offense guy and then uncorks the freaky Samoan athleticism with a big move or dive or whatever and he shouldn't sell like Ricky Morton but it, I tend to think that he should be more in a position where he's short and explosive instead of going for long singles matches in you know in in just in put together matches that we just heard about because he tackled the guy backstage because it's kind of a lot of repetition you get you are you catching the drift that i'm laying down to you are you laying catching my smacketh i guess so it's eh, it was, there's nothing wrong with it but it there was nothing earth shaking here and it wasn't anything to hold you to not to hold me or love me or squeeze me Loving, hugging, squeezing, pleasing. But uh, finally, AJ went for the springboard. Jimmy appeared and tripped him, and Solo spiked him. And it, honestly, even though they started 15 minutes before the top of the hour, before the end of the program, with the commercials, there was only eight minutes of match on the air, and it seemed longer. And then Jimmy hugged Solo, and Solo went to spike Jimmy. But Paul said no, and then Solo walked out, and Jimmy super kicked and big splashed off the top AJ Styles and held up one finger. 
and it it wasn't that one. It was the number one, and that's the way we went off the air. So this is a volatile group, Brian. Your thoughts on the interplay between the bloodliners? Until something happens, I'm kind of over it, and that was SmackDown. I have nothing else I got to add to that. <laughs> Uninspiring main event, despite AJ Styles' talent. You know, Roman Reigns has not been on for a couple of weeks now. I'm already a little tired of the stuff with the Usos. The LA Knight Miz stuff is the only stuff I really liked. Well, and and somebody's got to carry that program, for heaven's sake. Because if somebody don't carry it, it's just going to lay there and flop around like a dead fish. And that's that's kind of what we've been looking at. But uh, I, w- I wish there was something... To keep me busy, Brian, something to keep me busy while I'm staring at these matches, because you can't listen to the commentary. And and the the ring mat on the WWE programs, they don't make any noise. They've got those padded so bad. So really, you could just watch the show, except for the interviews, and you could listen to something else at the same time and probably be more entertained. I wish there was some way that I could watch one thing and listen to another thing. How in the world could that be done? Our friends from Raycon. You don't have to listen to that shit in the Raycon wireless earbuds, folks. I promise you. Only on this program. No, the Raycon wireless earbuds are our friends over there that we've been talking so well about for so many years now. They're doing a special. They're doing a special here because you know what time it is, Brian. What what time of year it is? What the what the season is? What the annual event of September is? Don't you? The annual event of September, Rosh Hashanah. Oh, for God's sake! No, it's schools back in session. Oh, back to school. Rosanna Arquette will have to wait because schools back in session, and that means that Raycon is having their annual back to school sale. Because here's the thing, kids. And young adults, well, people of all ages. And get kids, get your parents' permission before ordering the Raycon wireless earbuds. We've got to make that plain. But here's the deal. The kids are going back to school, and they're going to need Raycon wireless earbuds because they're going to be in these classrooms, and they're going to be being asked questions, and they're going to be taking tests, and they need some high-tech way in this modern scientific day and age to cheat. Because the teachers are smart to the note passing and the looking to the next desk for somebody else's answers. But thanks to the Bluetooth and the cell phones and the smartphones and the internet technology, what you can do is you can beat up the weakest, smartest kid in the class and force him to broadcast to you on your Raycon wireless earbuds the answers to all the tests that your teachers are going to give you. Well, we don't advise anyone to do that. You shouldn't do that. Although I did understand that's how Tony Khan became popular in high school. Are you denying that it is entirely possible to do what I just said can be done? It can be done. I didn't say it couldn't be done. I said it shouldn't be done. Well, who are you to be the arbitrator of social values and mores in the industry today? Who are you to advocate for someone to have their head bashed in to... Have, I, I don't even know I what you were saying. You, I <laughs> didn't say bash his head in. I said, you take the weakest kid in class, <laughs> but he, who is probably also the smartest, and you take him out behind the barn, and you give him a little, a little incentive to do your bidding, and then he's sitting there in the back, and the teacher's not going to suspect him because he's there all the time. He's acing these tests. She don't have to worry about him. He's a nerd. And meanwhile, what he's doing is he's got that little secret service microphone that comes on these on these cell phones that he's got it inside his his T-shirt and he's broadcasting to everybody in the class, hey, four plus four equals eight or whatever the question is. And everybody's going to ace that test courtesy of the Raycon wireless earbuds and their back to school sale because they want the folks at Raycon want your kids to be smart. And they were not able to do anything about their genetic makeup or whatever in the world you've done to destroy your own brain cells before you spawn them. So they're going to give them, they're going to give them a little boost, a little help, a little leg up in the learning industry. That's what they're going to do. Optimize gel tips. 
in a range of sizes for the perfect in-ear fit. So if if little Jughead has little teeny tiny ears or big elephant ears, it, you'd need to put your fist in there to plug up the hole. They can work it. And they won't budge. They're comfortable, but they won't come out. And that way they're not falling out when the teacher's walking by and, and seeing evidence. And they've got eight hours of playtime. If your kid's in school longer than eight hours, that means he's in detention. Well, fuck him. He's brought shame on the family. And they started just half the price of the other premium audio brands because Raycon wants your kids to have money left over to eat lunch, regardless of whether it's peanut butter and jelly or spam sandwiches or whatever. Raycon is in favor of free spam for all students. So, if you want customizable Raycon wireless earbuds with the sound profiles, the earbud tap functions, the noise isolation, the awareness modes, the high fidelity audio, the IPX6 water and splash resistance, whatever the fuck that means, and you want to be able to make sure that your kids don't flunk out of school so you can kick them out as soon as they turn 18? Well, then right now, go to buyraycon.com, B-U-Y-R-A-Y-C-O-N dot com slash J-C-E. You're going to get 20% off everything they got. They're back to school sale. Get them while they're hot. They're not stolen. They just overheat in your ears and potentially melt your eardrums. Buyraycon.com slash JCE, 20% off these fine quality Raycon wireless earbuds. All right, well, now that we've got all that settled, uh, should we go to Pittsburgh, Brian, for payback? Payback is hell, daddy. What do you think of Pittsburgh? I li- well, you know, you know who still has the record. For Bruno San Martino. The- oh, go ahead. No. For main eventing the most people ever to see a wrestling match in Pittsburgh, at least indoors. I know they did some stadium stuff in the early 60s. Big Bubba Rogers with Jim Cornette against Dusty Rhodes in the finals of the Bunkhouse Stampede 1987. 16,600 people at the Pittsburgh Civic Arena. They were standing. That was the biggest wrestling from the building, from their own chicken lips, the most people ever to see a wrestling match in Pittsburgh, the home of Bruno Sammartino. I'm quite proud of that one. Why do you think it resonated so well there? Was it the gimmick of the bunkhouse stampede? Was it how hot everything was? Why do you think Pittsburgh had that number? It was not only... It, it, the the finals had been promoted because it was Dusty's deal, right? So it had been beaten to death on TBS and the syndicated TV. But plus, if I'm not mistaken, and I'll I'll be happy to be corrected, that was the first time since Crockett had got real hot that we'd been in Pittsburgh. And I think the first time at the Civic Arena, if I remember correctly, because they had done, remember, they did a Three Rivers Stadium show with uh, Magnum and TA, uh, Magnum and TA, Magnum and Flair in what, 85? And they had a like a 50 minute match, even in the rain. And they had. There had been a couple of shows in that market, but that was the first big one with everybody on the card after we got real hot, if I remember correctly. You want to hear what the card was? Well, go ahead. It's better than what we're about to talk about. February 27th, 1987, Pittsburgh Civic Arena, 17,000 plus fans. Well, you know well, the exact I, I, number. I like, I like that they gave us that, but that would have been impossible in that arena. But 16,600 was... Uh, and and one hundred and sixty six thousand dollars at the gate. The average ticket I figured at ten dollars. Hector Guerrero versus Shaska Watley ended without a winner. Vladimir Pietrov defeated Jim Lancaster. Ivan Koloff and Dick Murdoch defeated Wahoo McDaniel and Dusty uh, Dusty and Dutch Mantel. <laughs> Lex Luger defeated Ricky Lee Jones. That was Ricky Gibson, Robert Gibson's older brother. The Fabulous Ricky Gibbs. NWA TV champion Tully Blanchard defeated Tim Horner. NWA World Tag Team champions Rick Rude and Manny Fernandez defeated the Rock and Roll Express. The U.S. champion Nikita Koloff defeated Ric Flair, the NWA World Champion, by disqualification. And the Bunkhouse Stampede Final steel cage match 
Dusty Rhodes defeated Big Bubba. No trouble. <laughs> Not a stacked lineup, though. I mean, a lot of stars on that show. Yeah, but it it wasn't the great. The Midnight were not on the on the show, and that was my first day back after we had burned Ronnie Garvin in in Charlotte on Valentine's Day. Um, and Ronnie was in uh, still allegedly in the hospital and partially blinded, and the angle was the Midnight's against Ronnie and now Jimmy and Jimmy had just turned babyface that night. It had just shown on TV the previous week, so we they couldn't have that match there, and I flew back in from my suspension, aka my first wedding and my honeymoon in Hawaii to do the Pittsburgh show with Bubba. This is early 87, so he probably, in February, I don't even think he was a horseman yet. Luger versus Ricky Gibson, Ricky Lee Jones, is that just to give Luger an opponent who could do a lot to make him look really good? Yeah, well, yes and no, in that it was to give an opponent, give him an opponent to make him look good and to get a good win. And unfortunately, by that point, Ricky Gibson's injuries and knees back had prevented him from doing what he did 10 years previously, but he still knew what he was doing psychologically and could get, you know, the heel over like that. But it wasn't like he was going out there taking those fucking sky high, insane backdrops and everything at that point in time. Unfortunately. What'd you think of the Flair and Nikita Koloff matches when Nikita turned baby face? They were, they were good because Flair could work. He had, Think how many matches he'd had with uh, Kerry Von Erich, with um, the Road Warriors. He could work the pattern with Luger. Uh, you know, later on, he, he could work the pattern, you know, of the big guy that all he had to do was bump off of and then heel down and get heat and then make the big comeback with press slam. And he could keep it exciting. And Nikita worked his gimmick very well he knew that he couldn't do a lot of shit so he relied on what he did do and it, to our eyes at that point in time he was not a polished worker but if you got a guy that looked like that of that size and that intensity and put him out today just to do what he could do then he'd be one of the biggest stars in the well he was one of the biggest stars in the business then but he'd be even bigger now because it's not common. See, I told you we'd have some fun talking about wrestling today, somehow. As long as we didn't talk about payback. Which I'm wondering, is that, Brian, the the emotion they wanted to instill in the heads of the fans? They they got the pay-per-view, they want to be paid back? Reimbursed, oh, even? It wasn't that bad. There was some oh, good come stuff. On. I, no, I'm, I'm joshing. Um... But they opened up with the cage match between Becky Lynch and Trish Stratus. And I wrote, this is the state of wrestling. The opening match is a girl's cage match. And again, I'm not going to give you a fucking blow-by-blow or play-by-play on this match, but they wonder why nobody's scared of dangerous match stipulations anymore. Because the girls can survive inside the steel cage. So what about a guy like Solo? Do we have to put him in a steel cage of barbed wire and there's some kind of goddamn curare poisoning on all the points? If if you get stuck, you'll instantly fucking croak or whatever. How, eh, do you see what I'm saying here? I don't have a big problem with it in the sense that it's not like it's a Becky Lynch versus a woman the size of Solo. It's two women that are somewhat the same size beating the crap out of each other so it's not like something that seems unrealistic you know past the point of you know the usual but i'm talking about it's a cage i've not even well this should have been their SummerSlam match probably well but let's not even go by gender what if you fucking when you envision people fighting in a cage okay the ufc calls the octagon the cage now in wrestling of days gone by uh, the cage match was cyclone fence or, you know, fucking chicken wire or whatever. In movies, if people are fighting in a cage, you think, oh, the roaring crowd and here's the blood and the sweat flying and these people are in this dirty cage and they're throttling each other or whatever. If it's two 125-pound women 
bashing each other against this steel in an immaculate spotless ring with well lit. It just, I don't fuck. I don't, you can't have blood. You shouldn't have blood because it's the girls. But how dangerous is this? Taking gender out of it, as I was going to say a second ago, what if it was a guy that looked like Bix fighting a guy that looks like Wally Cox in a fucking cage? <laughs> right? I didn't know you were going to go there. <laughs> and, and they come out of it without a scratch on them. Oh. What the fuck did then what, when... when, when when fucking Sylvester Stallone and fucking goddamn Chuck Norris or whoever the fuck goes to goddamn cage, what's then? Why should they sweat it? it, it Bix well, and Wally were fine. Well, again, that that Bix and Wally maybe the uh, super heavyweight division. I don't know, but we're talking about these two women. If we're going with the idea that, and I know we're not, and this isn't reality, but if there were weight divisions. This would be like a steel cage in the 125 pound <laughs> woman's division. <laughs> oh, God damn it. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, they kept it moving. Hey, do you what? have any, do you have any at all? Is there anything positive you see about the WWF style cages of the 80s and 90s? The blue cages? No, no, I hated those fucking things. The ring crew hated them. The boys, everybody hated them. The only thing that's so. Hogan and Bundy and guys that size could fucking climb them. Otherwise, big they boss man suck. Hogan superplexed boss the big man. boss man at the top of it. Yes, but the the problem with those things were they weighed a ton. They were steel bars, close to an inch thick, and they weighed a ton. The ring crew hated carrying them around. The fucking boys hated running into them because they would split you wide open if you did it wrong. They had no give whatsoever. And it was just all visual for the big giants to to climb. But when guys started doing shit and or trying to have Southern style cage matches where the heel would get flung face first into the cage, you couldn't fucking do it. But I thought, and, this, but again, with the caveat that I knew watching it too, like, oh my God, Jim's going to shit on not only that they started with a woman's match, but that it was a woman's cage match. I don't mind him starting with the women's match and get it out of the way. No, I'm, I'm, I'm joking there, but no, it just, again, here's another thing. Beca and w I'm going to compliment them finally here. They kept it moving. They Both girls can work. They did a nice bunch of stuff. It, uh, you know, a good match in itself. The concept uh, of it is what I'm questioning here. But then, also because it's WWE cage match, Becky hits her finish, and Zoe comes into the cage and makes a save. <laughs> because, of course... You can have interference and run-ins in a cage match due to the goofy rules that Vince has always loved for these cage matches, where the door is open, all, and the referee just standing there holding it, but it's not locked. People come and go. My favorite, is when yon. my favorite is when people dramatically close it behind themselves, but you know it's not locked. They didn't close it and it didn't shut. It could open right back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's like you're having an argument with somebody, you slam the fucking door in their face, right? It's like, well, I can't lock it because it's a fucking closet door or whatever. But anyway, so that happens, but then Becky beats up Zoe and then hits her finish on Trish, Trish off the top rope and one, two, three, it had to be 20 minutes. It was it more than 20 minutes. That's the only thing. Again, it was oh, long. It was so. very long. And then Zoe got mad at, at um, Trish and laid her out. So apparently that was Trish's adieu. And Zoe has got the heat passed to her, but so she got laid out by Becky and then Trish or uh, Zoe. I, I, thought, I thought it was really good. I really liked this match. I, I got into it more than I thought I would. And I really, really liked it. I thought it was really, really good. And again, I said they worked hard and they can work. And Trish is amazing to be. How old is she? I think she was like 46, maybe last time we checked. Whatever. You know, she was a fitness personality. So I assume she's always stayed in good shape. And she had a yoga eat, studio she opened up. It does yoga. I'm sure she eats turnips and parsnips for dinner and things like that. But 
A very good match. I just, the women's cage and the interference and the finish and the blah, blah, blah. It's just, seems like a pattern where I complain about the AEW women's division and then like that week WWE does an event and the women's match, the main women's match wins me over. It's multiple pay-per-views in a row now where, what, Bianca and EO, Zelina had a big match that was really good. Yeah. Rhea Ripley stuff. It's like WWE's women's matches that most of them that make it onto the main show that aren't comedy related are excellent matches. <laughs> it's just everywhere else is the problem. Well, we ain't, we ain't made it to the one that kind of won me at this point, but. Oh. Um, so then here comes John Cena. He is the host of Payback. And he makes his entrance. Yes. Can I say it? Um, I'm already sick of John Cena being well. Back. <laughs> oh, it. He just got here. I know, and he's such a nice guy, but I'm sick of him already. That's that's like it's like the guy just got over to your house. He just sat down on the couch. You haven't even cracked the the top on the can and handed it to him, and you're already like, this motherfucker. Is he ever going to leave? <laughs> So he you haven't he cuts, disagreed you haven't disagreed with me though. <laughs> well, no, I'm not tired of him yet. Well, here's the thing: at least we know something's going to happen most of the time. If um, you know, if he's around, but I, I I wasn't sick of him yet from SmackDown. But give me a chance here. <laughs> he cuts the promo where his job is to make tonight special, so he's going to be the guest referee. For L.A. Knight and The Miz. And then The Miz makes his entrance and cuts the promo and tells Cena that he sucks as the host. And then they do five minutes of cute scripted talk that is WWE-style entertainment where John then says, well, well, give me some advice then, Miz. What should I do? And The Miz knocks him kind of backhanded and, you know, he, but he tells, he's, he's got to be more involved. Don't dress like a Teletubby. Take charge. Make quick decisions. And so then Cena turns around and, and says, okay. And he gets his referee shirt and says, I will referee. And then they do the no, yeah, no, yeah thing. Rabbit season, duck season. So this was rotten, is what this was. And I would love to see somebody on a WWE program have a confrontation with some legitimate goddamn anger and hatred. And I'm not even talking about just Miz bowing up and, and using his acting skills to yell and pop his eyes out. Or, you know, everybody, I'm talking about le uh, some legitimate reason, some legitimate verbiage that you can tell that two guys are about ready to snatch each other by the goozle pipe. That's what I'd like to see, but this wasn't it. But why couldn't John have said it's my job to make tonight special and something else and let Miz come, instead of announcing he was going to be the referee to begin with and then confirming it later on, why didn't he make the snap decision on a sperm of the moment that he'd be the referee to confound the Miz even more appropriately? I don't, I don't know. We've established that WWE wrestlers could just make their own stipulations on the spot, so why not? Well, now, well, now in this case, he's the host, so I think that gives him the the authorization to do that anyway. So we can't. We, that, there's a loophole there. I hated this. I thought it went too long. It's the kind of WWE segment I don't like. And the Miz to me wasn't bad at delivering his stuff and being the Miz. Cena gets too corny for me. I sorry to use corny. Yeah, he but, uh, hey, hey, yeah, there, what the, hold on here. You there, know what cowboy. I mean, though. He gets well, too, too corny. Cheesy. To put it. Cheesy. Too, too cheesy. Too, too silly. But then here came L.A. Knight. And they had L.A. Knight in the Miz with John Cena as referee. And the second match on the pay-per-view, the bell rang 50 minutes into the show. 5-0. Because now they're turning the the premium live events into Raw without commercials, and it just it, they still they, have commercials actually. Well, they still have commercials, just not. You don't. They don't have to take a break. They just put their own in the show that you're watching. But yes, you know that's anyway. 
the fans are doing the thing where they chant, yeah, when L.A. Knight punches or, you know, when he does the the head bonk on the, the desk, which he did here. But, and it was a back and forth. <sighs> Miz has been doing two-minute jobs for everybody. This was competitive, but if you didn't, if you overlook how Miz has been used for the last year or whatever the fuck, where everybody's beating him, including the, you know, grade school kid in the front row, this was good in that it was back and forth and gave L.A. Knight a lot of chances to have a flurry because the people get behind him. And then, you know, finally, um, after the back and forth, boom, 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 they went into a few false finishes. And finally, again, L.A. Knight hit the L.A. elbow and hit his finish. Boom, one, two, three. It was 15 minutes bell to bell. It got maybe a little bit long right before they really kicked it in. But that's what they should have done. Again, L.A. Knight wins one, two, three with his finish, and it wasn't, you know, he didn't have to walk through hell with gasoline britches on to do it. And then L.A. Knight and Cena shake hands, and Cena raises his hand, so there's the rub there, and that's what they were trying to accomplish by having John be the referee because he's not really great at it. What do you think? In terms of the overall thing, it's amazing how over L.A. Knight has gotten himself when he when his music hit. The fans knew he was coming out, and they reacted like it was a surprise. Big, big pop. Massively over. I thought the match went too long. It was too slow at times. It, I, it, it started dragging a bit there toward the, what, what would you say, the 75 percentile mark? It, was, it took too long to get where it was going, and, you know, and, I, and I liked it, and it was too long. I just missed the era of, like, and I never thought I would say this, just good seven-minute matches. <laughs> just in and out. You know, I loved WrestleMania three as a kid. That was a three-hour pay-per-view with however many matches. They were all like seven minutes, six minutes, four minutes. You didn't even think about it. Well, see, that the, it, there was variety, though, because at least on the NWA or WCW pay-per-views, the main events, the top matches would get more time, except if it was a gimmick match, didn't need it. But the preliminaries were much shorter. And it balanced out. You gave more attention to the matches that you were more interested in seeing at the top of the card. And we didn't start with gauge matches. And it's interesting. You know, if you look at some of the matches that were actually short and you extended them, it wouldn't help everyone. If you took Piper Adonis and turned it into a 20-minute match, I don't know if it makes that a better <laughs> match. I don't think it does. If you took Coco versus Butch Reed and you turned that from a three-minute match to a 20-minute match, probably would have been a great match. I don't know if that crowd was the crowd for it at the Silver Dome. But now just every match goes and goes. And goes and goes. Well, speaking of going, let's go on. Uh, the U.S. title was on the line with our boy Austin Theory against Rey Mysterio, and the bell rang for this, the third match on the program, an hour and 15 minutes into the show. The bell rang to start the third match. How does this fucking happen on pay-per-view? We used to be asking people to pay for a, a kind of a televised house show, non-interrupted with Gaga and backstage and commercials and advertisements. And, and now it's... it's uh, Austin Theory is great, as we've talked about. Rey Mysterio is a pro and a true legend. And they did the match where Ray fights from the bottom because that's his thing now. And that's, you know, what suits him. And I love both guys, but this is, this felt to me like a Raw or SmackDown match with longer with no breaks in the middle of the match, at least. We see it. It's a WWE style match that we see over and over. And Theory is just better than most people at it. And. Ray is bulletproof with the fans and always exciting. So, but it's just, it is what it is. The cinnamon toast crunch in pastels on the Titan Tron and the railing make it look like a kid's show from Nickelodeon in 1988. And finally, Ray hit the 619. Theory went for his finish and Ray rolled him up one, two, three. It's not like we're going there. Again, there's no. 
Eddie Graham style roller coaster of emotions finishes involved in this shit anymore. It's kind of like, well, we'll do it for a while and then we'll get him up and we'll go. I thought it was a really effective match in the sense that I got up uh, and looked for some cinnamon toast crunch in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> that was all right. You kind of hit on the main thing. It just felt like another SmackDown match. It was hard to take this seriously. There were matches. There are matches that you look forward to seeing, matches that could surprise you. Sadly, just because of the way it's been played out, and it feels like I've either seen Theory versus Ray or Theory versus Escobar a lot lately, it just feels like something I would have seen on SmackDown. Well, here is the problem also. We're seeing so much because they're showing us so much. How different can it be when the each company sets up their TV, their lighting, their ring looks the same, and we're seeing a lot of the same talent? It... it how how different can anything be at this point? Because there's so fucking much of it. The, the Steel City street fight with Owens and Zayn against Priest and Finn of the Judgment Day was, it was a departure of what they've been doing on this card, but then it's stuff that Owens and Zayn, they love this shit. They wanted to do this shit in Ring of Honor. They did it for very little money in Ring of Honor, and now they're making a lot more money, but this is still all they want to do. They love the, it's. I don't know where Priest's background is. I know Finn's been, you know, he was a pro for a long time before he got in this system. He's an old veteran. I assume he's not one of the crowd that just, oh, I wish we could have a gimmick match with weapons. But um, the, 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 as soon as they rang the bell, immediate four-way, they go to the floor. As soon as they get in the ring, immediately they got chairs and kendo sticks, and then they go back to the floor. And then Sammy dives, and then Owens and Zane pull out garbage cans and beat on both the heels over and over again. And then Owens reveals his Terry Funk shirt. And then they pina colada... Pina Colada, Pinata, Finn. Do you like Pina Colada? <laughs> do you again getting caught in a garbage can in the rain? They Pinata Finn with the garbage can over his fucking head, and it, I'm like Jesus Christ! I'm. That's where I wrote. Why don't both companies just pick a match and put it on a loop and play it? And it's cheaper. You don't have to pay all the boys. Because it's all the same shit that everybody does. Then Sammy and Owens pulled out a table and set it up and then walked away from it. It took over to the heels, and then the heels took over on them. And I re they're like five minutes in the, in the match, and nobody has actually taken a bump in the ring. And then they got in the ring with a garbage can and five chairs, but nothing was happening. And... <clears throat> There's a lot of milking going on in these in the garbage matches with the furniture and the uh, whatever. If all you're going to do is a weapons match, it's got to be get in it and get go fast and do shit and get out of it. Because if it goes long too, then it gets brutally boring and repetitious and it's just, it's inanity. And they do the chair shots over and over. And then they go back and they fight in the back of the arena. And then Dominic comes out blatantly to help three on two because it's no DQ. And then the baby faces disappear while Dominic and Finn and Priest are just standing there talking to each other apparently about what they can do now because they're not going to wonder where the fucking baby faces have gone when suddenly... The baby faces reappear dressed in hockey uniforms with hockey sticks. And Owens is his whole face is covered in fake blood. And they start beating these fucking guys up with the hockey sticks. And they beat them back to the entrance. And then they beat up Dominic. And then they fight him back to the ring. And the longer that Owens goes, the more the fake blood wipes off his face. Until finally, there's only the 
the slight stain of whatever the material is or the chemical is in fake blood that makes it stain your skin not like real blood. So Owens was, I used to be of the idea that if anybody ever used fake blood in wrestling, they should be shot at sunrise without even being given a last cigarette. Except if you're doing something from the throat, okay? I, we can get by with that. But then I'm starting to wonder, should I admire Owens's goddamn dedication to garbage wrestling that he's had since the Ring of Honor days, that he knows that if they're doing all this shit, somebody should be bleeding, but they're not allowed to actually have blood, so he used fake blood. Is that a weird kind of dedication to his craft? No, I think you could say one of the good qualities of Kevin Owens is that he's true to who he was years ago. <sighs> but anyway, so uh, Sammy and Kevin arrange the chairs in a shop class project in the ring and then Priest suplexes Sammy on top of him. So that'll teach him. They get back on the floor. All of Owens' blood is wiped off. They're back in the crowd. They're back to the back of the arena. I wrote, I can't take any more. I zipped ahead a bit. Uh, Kevin swantoned off the balcony and put Dominic through a table, but Owens's legs hit the floor hard. He's, <laughs> I wrote, what a maroon, what an imbecile. He's going to cripple himself doing this shit. He's got to be 40 years old now, or close to, and he's not goddamn Hercules. And he over-rotated a little bit on that one, and Dominic was spared the brunt of the explosion, and he went right over on his legs and his big fat ass. And then here comes J.D. McFunco Pop. And he comes out, and he's going to do whatever the fuck, I don't know, and Rhea speared Owens through the railing, and Sammy hit his finish on Finn, and got a two count, and Dominic saved, who's not even in the match, saved with a briefcase shot over Sammy's head right next to the referee, because it's a street fight, and Finn covered him in one, two, three, and they are the new champions. So, a street fight match is traditionally a blow-off match where the babyface is going to win in the end because he can finally give the heel back all of his dastardly tactics and you don't bury the referee because of that. But when somebody not even involved in the match blatantly comes and hits one of the babyface champions over the head with a blunt instrument right in front of the referee, no DQ or not, and then they just pin him. That's not psychologically for the wrestling industry the right kind of fucking heat. I'm sorry. Your thoughts? I'm not going to add too much to that. I agree with you. And I'm sick of these kind of matches, so it's hard to see one and think of it as special from anything else. And then they got into their teleporting phase of the match where they all of a sudden had their hockey uniforms on. I'm happy Judgment Day is uh, has won. I guess that's the... One good thing I could say. <sighs> Something different. I'm, I've been sick of uh, Zayn and Owens, as I said on the show, for a little while now. Well, I couldn't wait for that one to be over with. And after... Wait a minute, I've lost my other note here. There we go. Two hours in, we've had four matches, and now guess what we get? A live interview. On pay-per-view, and not even a live interview with the Horseman, or a live interview with fucking Terry Funk. We get a live interview with Grayson fucking Waller and his whole goofy set. And he brings out Cody because Cody's got a big announcement. Now, have you noticed that they are now, if, if they're running a promotion where the fans are getting free ice cream, Cody's going to be the one to announce it or be responsible for it. His picture's on the card. You turn in for the free ice cream. It's brilliant. This is out of the Eddie Graham playbook. But Cody is involved. Remember, he got Sammy and like his dad. Kevin back together. Like his yeah. dad. Involved got, in everything. But he got Sammy and Kevin back together. He was the peacemaker and the mediator. And he gives, you know, he 
overcomes this obstacle and over here he makes this special announcement and does something else for the fans they like. It's brilliant. However, I wrote watching this because what I did was since uh, my mother-in-law was still in town when this aired, we were having a nice family dinner instead of me watching this shit. So I watched it early in the morning on Sunday morning and watching this in the morning ruins my whole day, <laughs> to be honest with you. Uh, I write, Grayson Waller is being forced down our throats and I continue to ask why, because he's not a star and uh, the way to make a star is not to give him a segment where he acts like a star. It's to make him a star first and then give him a segment because he's a star. And they beat around every bush they could find, including the potted plants in the ring to stretch this announcement out. But basically Cody saw a wrong that needed to be righted. And he introduced a new member of the raw roster officially right now. Jay Uso. And here comes Jay and he's back on raw. And Cody leaves and Jay gets in the ring. And Waller starts to fucking speak to him and pretty much pisses him off and he doesn't say a word. He just super kicks Waller and leaves him laying there colder than a banker's heart and walks out the end. Did I cover all the high points? All the high points, yes. I just want to say that I've been a fan of Cody's stuff recently, but his interplay with Waller here was awful. This was not good. This was not a good thing at all. There was nothing here. There was no reason Waller's annoying. He doesn't get he he gets annoyance. He doesn't get heat. And they're booing him because they don't want to see this shit or hear it. And there was nothing for Cody to even made the most conversation he could, but it's like, here, um, you know, do this 30 second promo. You got seven minutes. What okay. But you know what the biggest problem is, don't you, Brian? That we're still talking about payback? No, the biggest problem is Grayson Waller. That's the biggest problem. Because you're watching Grayson Waller, whether it's on your TV, whether it might be on your computer or your phone or your streaming device. And you know, with the technology these days, I'm afraid that, that we don't know the truth. It may be that all those people that you're watching on whatever your device is, they know who you are and they know where you are and they're taking your information down. So they're one of these days, Grayson Waller himself is going to come knocking on your front door, one to do his Grayson Waller show right in your living room. And you have to take preventative measures right now. So if you don't want Grayson Waller to know where you are, you got to get Express VPN. And Brian, you've heard about this, haven't you? We're, uh, well, we've talked a lot about Express VPN, yes. Well, no, I mean the, the the these big media corporations, the broadcasters and the streamers and the fishers and all these people are running down the creek without a paddle. They're all taking your information down. They know who you are. When you watch SmackDown or you watch one of these pay-per-views on the cock, well, right there, Grayson Waller knows who you are. And I don't think that's thing, how that works in any way, but go ahead. Uh, well, it is because they're, they're tracking you it down. Isn't. No, it isn't. It doesn't work and like You that. don't want Grayson Waller knocking on your door, do you? Even if there's a chance? The listeners don't have to worry. There's no chance Grayson Waller will be knocking on your door. That's right, because you can get Express VPN and he won't know what door to knock on. He'll be, he'll be knocking on doors from... Now it'll kingdom come and he won't be able to find you because you're just not there because Express VPN is hitting you. They put you underground. But with an oxygen tank, you'll be able to breathe, folks, because Express VPN makes sure that all these evil corporations can't keep track of where you are. You know how Netflix is screwing everybody. Why they've got all these programs blocked for different countries and different places and different regions. You might not be able to watch Dumbo Does It Donkey Style in every country on Earth. But if you get ExpressVPN... And that may then, be a good thing. Well, by cracky, Netflix isn't the one that ought to decide that. They've got thousands of shows. 
<laughs> yes, they do. Of yes, programs. they do. That's not one of them. Well, see, well, one of these days they'll pay the rights fees and they'll get that too. But you want to be sure you're going to be able to watch it? You got to get Express VPN because you only get a fraction of the programs that Netflix has based on your location. So what you do is you control where you want Netflix or other streaming websites or Grayson Waller himself to think where you're located, where they you are, that, that. Did I mess up that grammar? Wow, I don't know you what that was. You control where you want them, them to think that you're at, not where you actually are. <laughs> you could be somewhere else. No, you control where you actually are. Well, you control where you want to be, too. All you, you gotta can do go where you want to go. Go do what you want to do with ExpressVPN. You open their app, and be careful now. Don't drop it. Just open it, and then you select, let's say Bolivia. I don't know. They got ninety-four. Where is I? I saw that number. Where is it? Is it ninety-four different countries that they have servers in? People working at restaurants all over the world, and and these servers. No, not those kind of servers. The after kind of... they get off their shift at the restaurant, no. they sit down and they start uh, compiling lists of uh, all the people that want to be somewhere else, and then they send you there. ExpressVPN has dedicated servers, and they are not the human kind. Well, they're very dedicated, all right. I'll say that they're very earnest in their efforts. But you open the app for ExpressVPN, you select whatever country you want to be in, you tap one button. And then you refresh your page, because it's probably stinking at this point. And once that page is refreshed, boom! You're in a whole nother place, a whole nother state of mind. And nobody can find you, so you can watch all of the unsavory and potentially pornographic programming that you would like to watch, and nobody's going to be able to put the finger on you or any other of their appendages in any of your other orifices because you've outsmarted them, and you have indeed returned the penetration of orifice back in their direction because you're getting what you want, and you're putting one over on somebody. Once again, we And that's what everybody wants. That's not what everyone wants, but once again, we want to remind everyone that there are wonderful programs all around the world, maybe services around the world that you can't access because of where you are, Perfectly legal services. Not Dom Dombo. Dumbo doesn't donkey. <laughs> Dombo doesn't donkey style or anything else. I, I, I've I've lost. We, we are in the time what, machine. Ladies what and point are you? What point are you making here? I don't know. What are you trying to say? I'm telling the people that that they can go right now. To expressvpn.com slash JCE and stop paying full price for these streaming services and only getting a minute little microscopic portion of their content. Get your money's worth. And if you go to expressvpn.com slash JCE, not only will you get your money's worth, but you're going to get an extra three months of ExpressVPN Absolutely free, complimentary, gratis. That means you pay nothing. ExpressVPN.com slash JCE, three months free. And, you know, spend those three months in Honolulu. They'll send you there. No, Just they won't don't, send you don't there. Forget the, don't forget the sunscreen because it's hot this time of year out there. They'll send you. You'll. That's where you'll be located as far as anybody else knows. That's right, but your feet will be firmly on the ground where you are now. There'll be no free trips to Honolulu or any other exotic locale. Wait a minute. Do, uh, do you mean you have to you have to stand the entire time that you're in a fictitious country? Your feet are going to be on the ground. You can't sit down, lay down, put your feet up in a hammock, relax. Are your feet on the ground while you sit in this chair? No, actually, they're bent up behind me. They're bent up behind you? Really, Lanny? What are you doing over there? No, I mean, I mean, you know, I'm just sitting in my yoga position. No, actually, they're on the ground now, but right now they're on a stack of copy paper. So how about that? See? <laughs> well, we're talking about ExpressVPN. Don't let Grayson Waller know where you are. ExpressVPN.com slash JCE. Even if you didn't get the three free months, it's worth it to not let Grayson Waller know where you are. That's right. And that was WWE Payback from Pittsburgh. No, we're, we're not done. That wasn't it? That wasn't it. No. Don't you remember the the, the girls match that you? I, th oh. I thought you were talking oh, about yeah. Stole Your Heart. 
Oh, yeah. I will say when I watched it live, I forgot how many matches that were also. And after the tag title match, I was so like, oh, okay, you know, short and sweet, nice pay-per-view. And then I kept going. And going. And going. Rhea Ripley versus Raquel Gonzalez Rodriguez de Molina Jr. Um, Raquel is taller. I think Rhea is more voluptuous. I think we can say that. That has nothing to do with anything here. Well, as far as, as we're, we're talking to how they match up, the tail of the tape, so to speak. <laughs> you need more tape for Rhea than you would for Raquel. Significantly more tape. Possibly Raquel might just get away with a couple of Band-Aids. Okay, okay, less. will you be nice? Come on. <laughs> I'm just saying. But they were. everybody was looking forward to this matchup because, you know, size versus size. Okay, Rhea Ripley has finally met somebody that's as big or bigger than she is, and, you know, what's going to happen here? And I, I was, again, I was concerned because a lot of times the size versus size you know, the giant versus giant doesn't work out as as pleasantly to the eye as one's anticipation in their in their mind. This was not bad. Raquel has a lot of potential. She's got the size. She's got the strength. She she works very hard. She ain't as smooth as hopefully she will be in the future or she could be yet. But Rhea made this. She's got balance. She's got timing, the basics, the personality, the psychology. She understands healing, the little things. The uh, I mean, it just she is natural in the ring. She's relaxed and does this fairly naturally, whereas I think Raquel seems like she's still wound up a little tight. She's still a little nervous or focused, trying. It's not second nature to her yet. Um, I think it, Rhea slowed down a bit having to do a lot of Raquel stuff, but at the same time, you know, when she took over and was getting the heat, I was like, how is she this good at this age? She's still young, inexperienced, etc. But she works holds, which most of the guys on either one of these programs don't hit it. When she gets a hold, she's working it. There's motion going on. There's effort. There's a a stance involved in it. When Raquel made her comeback, she went from zero to hero in five seconds. From I was down to okay, I'm doing all this now. And they went they went into a few false finishes. The problem here with poor Raquel is that the fans were not going crazy for her because even though Rhea's a heel, they don't want to see her lose. They just want to see her. So she doesn't, she's so good, she doesn't have a lot of heat heat. She's got a lot of, she's a star heat. Um, it, it got a little long then and a little sloppier. And then finally Dominic came to the ring and Raquel power slammed Dominic. And then Rhea kicked her and hit the riptide one, two, three. It wasn't bad. I liked it. It was a little long. But again, you know, Rhea Ripley's a prodigy. No two ways about it. I will watch almost anything she does. Almost anything. There are some limits. What do you think? Really good match. Rhea Ripley's the best women's wrestler in the business. And like I said before, I could see her eventually being maybe the best ever because she's so good. That bump she where she lands on the top of her head. Oh, yeah. Is incredible. And I've seen her do it a few times now. Each time I wince... Well, clearly she she does it and does it well. She's the best in the business. She's the very best women's wrestler in the business. Will she make it long enough to be the greatest of all time before oh, she goes go. to Hollywood? Hollywood. You always bring up I'm Hollywood. Just, I think I did it earlier in this program that we when we started it about three or four days ago. Corny Bloom. Anyway, well, the bloom will be off the rose, I'll tell you that. And the bloom is already off the rose of this pay-per-view. I don't know, well, I know which is a bigger insult. Uh, WWE delivers a lackluster, substandard pay-per-view main event, so AEW has to top them by just bringing out the fucking full-fledged joke book. But the world title number three was on the line because Roman Reigns was off work, and poor Seth Franklin Rollins, who has been designated the carrier of the, the belt 
that is known as the working man's world title because the fucking poor putts that holds it has to defend it constantly while the other guy gets to pick his spots in main events of all the great pay-per-views. And Seth Franklin Rollins had the pleasure and privilege here of going up against one of the finest tomato cans in the history of wrestling to the point where he was even dressed in a full red bodysuit. He must have heard I called him a tomato can. Did he, Brian? What do you think? Shaky Nakamura. No, he, he's worn that before. I think he got it made just for this occasion. No. A big, bright, red, delicious tomato can. Um, do you think Nakamura's entrance scares children with the convulsions and the twitching and the weird epileptic movements? Should Has anyone ever called an ambulance when they've seen him approaching the ring in that fashion? I was about to ask you the exact same thing about Seth Rollins' entrance. Well, I I think the children are more or less laughing at him because I don't I don't think they're scared of him. I think Shaky actually would cause it like when Linda Blair turned her head all the way backwards. He's doing some some weird contortions there. How was this a pay-per-view main event? It wasn't for me. I was. You know, look. Despite everything he did in his career and how over he was, by 1987, I really didn't want to watch any more Jimmy Valiant matches. When you get to that stuff in the NWA, maybe you got some good promos still, but I don't need to see any more of those matches, and I kind of feel the same way about Rollins. I know he's really good in the ring. It's not a fair comparison. It's about just being sick of, I don't know, I can't... I thought you were going to say that about Nakamura. No, I'm not really into him right now either, but to me, the bigger problem is Rollins. I can't get behind this guy. He's the world champion. He comes out there... Acting like he's on PCP and I'm supposed to give a shit? I can't. I think he's actually just on the P. He left off the CP. I mean, I would take Seth Franklin Rollins against some... I'd like to see Seth and Brock. That would be interesting. Have we ever even seen that? See, for the world title, that might make this legitimate, but they can't take Nakamura, who's been either off, injured, or an afterthought for who knows how long on that program. And in a couple of weeks, they build up this, you know, confrontation between the two of them and expect it to be a world championship match. This is the company that gave us Austin and Rock and Michaels and Hart and Rollins and Nakamura. And I still see a middle-aged man in a red pleather scuba suit here. He worked harder than ever here and longer than he's had an opportunity to in a while, but everybody knows he had no chance. He wasn't going to win. It's not a major rivalry. And it still went forever. And then Rollins hit the pedigree and Shaky hit a kick and Rollins hit a stomp out of nowhere. One, two, three, 25 fucking minutes. I don't think anybody would have been insulted if Seth put him away in 15. But uh, did we ever establish how old a motherfucker he is? Yeah, you keep acting like he's so much older than... He looks to he me to be not. older than Come the on. ancient mariner. He looks I'll like his social break. security number is one. He looks like when he was in school, they didn't have history. That's ridiculous. He looks like he's his mother charged the light brigade. He's from Japan. What he's does 43. That have to do this age? He's 43 years old. He's lived a he's hard life. He's the same life. age as me. He's lived a hard life, as Mama Cornette used to say. Now, I'll tell you what. I haven't seen you in 10 years, but the last time I saw you, you looked 10 years younger than Shaky Nakamura does now. Easily. Well, I'm a very good-looking man. <sighs> so, that was that. I just can't help it. He well, can't help it or you can't help it? I can't it. help it. And I can't help that that was payback. Like you said, I guess the question you asked in the beginning was, right, are the fans going to ask for to be paid back after this? Maybe so. You know, when people buy tickets to shows that are announced as premium live events or pay-per-views or whatever, they're got, they got to be thinking, oh, I'm going to see Roman Reigns versus whoever. The, and they got Seth versus Shaky. They seem to handle it well. They've still cheered and had a good time, but there has to be some element of letdown. Well, speaking of element of letdown, uh, I think we're done with the WWE portion of the day. We certainly are, and I'll tell you, you know what the problem was with the whole pay-per-view, why nobody was over? 
You know why, don't you? It's, it's plain as the nose on your face. I did not know why, no. Nobody was over because nobody came out of a box. That's the tried and true method, Brian. That's the way to get people over. Just have them burst out of a box. Because whether you're a person, a place, or a thing, if you burst out of a box in front of a crowded room, you're going to get over. That's a way to make a star. And if you want stuff bursting out of boxes in your house on a monthly basis, all you've got to do is just sign up for your brand new, brand spanking new, and your very own box of awesome. And then, Brian, you know all the things that come out of that box of awesome. Sometimes they pop out. Sometimes they burst out. Well, they actually sent a Dalmatian puppy last month, and that thing just popped right out of that box. Their boxes are secure. Nothing pops out. Nothing breaks out. Everything is there for you to open up and discover. And there are no live animals or creatures that are shipped by Box of Awesome and Bespoke Post. Well, then who in the heck sent me that Dalmatian puppy? Tony Khan. I thought that was my Box of Awesome. I had to send him back because uh, Harley didn't get along with him. But I boxed him up in the same box and I stuck a hole in it. Just to make sure he could breathe. Well, what was the return address? Where'd you send it? I someplace in the Philippines. But that, anyway. That's not our good friends at Bespoke Post and the wonderful product that is known as Box of Awesome. You know what? That should have been my clue because Box of Awesome comes from right here in this United States of America that we live in. But I'm sure they ship around the world, folks. But regardless of where you live, or perhaps you can team up with the express vpn people and con the people at box of awesome but no no bad idea i guess those two things would conflict with each other if you told somebody that you ordered something from that you were somewhere else than where you are then you really couldn't get what you wanted plus they are all our friends but every box of awesome is filled with carefully chosen gear from the best small browns brands or browns the best small brands around the world is what they are From camping gear essentials to autumn cocktail upgrades, cozy threads even, hey, that's a hip way to describe clothing. Box of Awesome has collections for every part of your life, and 90% of everything that comes in your Box of Awesome each month is from a small up-and-coming brand, a small business, mom and pop, the heartbeat of America, the good solid citizens of the Midwest that plant the seeds in the soil and then water them and watch the sun come down and they burst into buds and they shoot up toward the sky to feed the country and the world. These kind of salt of earth people is what's putting this stuff in your box and it's coming to you and you ought to be grateful for it. You know, good son of a bitches, you take it for granted because each box is valued at around $70, but you only pay a fraction of that price. No, you won't pay full price. Not you. Not people like you. You want to take advantage of these small up-and-coming businesses. Well, it's free to sign up, and you can skip a month or cancel any time, so you can punish these people by ripping them off and not paying them fair price. No. What because you... the, what... the Box of Awesome is giving you such a great deal that I'm surprised these people can stay in business. The, as cheap as this stuff is being sold to the customers, it's quality merchandise. But you're paying almost nothing, folks. When you go to boxofawesome.com, all you do is you take the quiz and your answers help them pick the right box of awesome for you and then stuff you're interested in, things of that genre, are delivered to you constantly every month. And and again, you're paying us a fraction of the price it's worth. How are these, these poor mom and pop businesses going to survive? You ought to pay twice as much for the box of awesome you get every month as you're doing. I can't believe you're taking advantage of these people like this. Box of awesome is helping the small mom and pop businesses, not taking advantage of them. Well, so I don't know why you would prices. go with this narrative of all the things you can go with. They're going, they, they, they ought to raise their, their prices. Box of awesome can't be making any money. They're selling stuff like this. They're practically giving it away. This is high quality merchandise. Everybody should be signing up for this. They want this. They need it. They got to have it. And you ain't going to pay much for it. And if you go to boxofawesome.com, code JCE right now, you're going to get 20% off your first monthly box. 
Just use the code JCE at checkout, and if you're getting 20% off, and it's already a fraction of the price of the value of the merchandise, they're practically giving this stuff away. So right now, before all these people go out of business and starve because they can't pay their bills, buy everything Box of Awesome has at boxofawesome.com and enter the code JCE. I don't expect them to last much longer, so just buy everything they offer. It might You might as well get it before everybody else does. Boxofawesome.com. That's right. Wonderful products, wonderful companies. Check this out today. Box of Awesome. Ignore everything that Jim just said other than that. Well, well, wait a minute. You want them to ignore me on my own show? When it comes to the things you just said other than the positive things, yes. So just accentuate the positive, eliminate the negative, and don't mess around with Mr. In-Between. Box of Awesome. Well, once you collide with your Box of Awesome, you'll never want to go back, but I can't say the same thing. Apparently now for our favorite program on the air, formerly Collision, the September 2nd episode of this program was uh, the the opening was the statement that Tony Khan made where he said he feared for his life as well as Punk's rampage endangering production staff and innocent people backstage and couldn't be tolerated. That's on the YouTube clip and also the separate podcast feed we mentioned earlier about Punk's firing. But Tony did this in 90 seconds on the opening of the program, reading it off a teleprompter in front of a green screen. And it's also, as we mentioned in that clip, he came out on stage and told the people in the building. It it took him about six minutes to sputter it all out, and they booed him unmercifully through the whole exchange so can we just go ahead and say brian they're going to scrap elton john saturday night is not all right for fighting because the last time a guy got in a fight on saturday night he got fired in aew so they're getting rid of elton john and they're going to go with another british pop group to replace elton john did you hear about this i did not hear about this no a paper lace the night chicago died in the heat of a summer night, in the land of one Bill Field, the town of Chicago died, cause Tony was weak-willed, when a man named Tony Khan took a shit right on his lawn, and he fired his biggest star in the middle of the war, the night Chicago died. na 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 the night Chicago died. And this was the day hearing died. Well, you should have tucked your ears in if you didn't want to use them. I wanted to use them. <laughs> so so then Tony made his statement, and again, Saturday night is not all right for fighting. You can get fired for doing stuff like that. And then Tony Schiavone, the other beleaguered Tony, they opened up on him in the ring and they completely muted the crowd because as soon as they started, I thought I heard we want punk or something related us, a chant started and then the crowd came down and you heard Tony's mic in the ring and you heard him introduce Ricky Starks and big bill. And here they came. And once Starks got out there, they settled down. I noticed that this crowd, and especially even the pay-per-view crowd, which we'll get to, unfortunately, here before too long, they were respectful to the people in the ring that they knew they liked, they knew didn't have any part to play in the fucking deal. Uh, but This wasn't people, Baltimore 91. No. This wasn't We Want Flair. It it well it and it wasn't we're gonna hijack everybody's match. They were respectful to the people that they liked and that didn't have anything to do with it, and they pinpointed Tony Khan and the Buckaroos as the people responsible for them not seeing what they thought they were gonna fucking see when they bought the tickets. So they were a respectful rowdy crowd. But anyway, Starks came out. And this promo, he was venting because now what this was apparently supposed to be punk. 
And his promo in the context of the storyline and the context of the wrestling television show and what's been going on made absolutely no sense. But if you knew what the fuck was going on, he's pissed. Every time I climb up the hill, I get dragged back down. I'm so tired of having to start over. No matter how many times they try to use me and abuse me, I'm going to be, I'm going to be here. And, and Big Bill, you're a hell of a dude, too. You overcame addiction. I believe in you and myself. I'm a man, and I'm going to come out and do what I need to do. What a babyface promo, right? I mean, yeah, again, it was completely babyface promo because he was, again, pissed off that another angle match opportunity has been pulled out from under him. But then he gets back into gimmick, but he's turned pure, pure baby face, but then he calls Steamboat out. And then they do the deal where Steamboat comes out and has a contract because he's heard Starks wants a strap match. So he's got the contract. Starks wants to sign it. Ricky Starks versus the Dragon in a strap match. And Starks signs that bad boy. <laughs> and then they bring out Brian Danielson. Thank God, even with a, with a brace on or however early he's coming back, they had this available because they may have dodged, I wrote at the time, this bullet. And the fans are immediately on Starks like, you fucked up, you fucked up the dragon, Brian Danielson. And they ended it, it, it was kind of an awkward out with just a stare down face off or whatever, but at least they got out of that. And as we will find out, they turned a negative into a positive, as as Vinnie Mac would say, because it turned out to be the highlight of the pay per view. But um, hi, yeah, yeah. If if it had been two weeks ago, would Danielson have been able to do this? He he wasn't able to come back for the Wembley Stadium, the biggest fucking crowd of all time, where they would have thrown babies in the air for Brian Danielson. But you know, they rushed him up for this because I guess they had no choice. Plus, I think, he, believe it or not, despite how brutal the match was, I think he could work around the gimmick of the strap match with his arm condition a little better than he could a physical yes. match. I mean, they were talking him and Omega for Wembley. There's no way he could have done that if he has an arm issue. No, no. And with the strap and it being on the other arm and him not having to do, you know, multiple things off the top and crazy stuff that you can't do with a strap. It was beneficial, but nevertheless. This was good. I mean, Starks is great. And you can imagine that frustration. You know, he was about to have the run with CM Punk. That would have been the main run, the main feud on Saturdays. That's out the window. Man, when I talk to MJF, I assume that maybe, maybe MJF felt a year ago. Remember, he returned to work the yeah. program of Punk. And then it all went out the window right away. My only issue with this is, you know, specifically with the big bill line pointing out that he overcame addiction. That's a wonderful thing for a baby face to point out. Yes. You want to cheer big bill at that point. <laughs> you want to cheer Ricky. And then he goes back to being a heel. Danielson, who we last saw. I mean, again, he's still a member of the Blackpool Combat Club. He comes out with the other heels, but he's coming out as a baby face <laughs> because why else would he be defending the honor of Ricky the Dragon Steamboat? And I mean, it's a minor thing, but as soon as you saw the contract and it said Ricky Starks versus the, the dragon. dragon, you kind of knew what was coming next. And and that's but the, there's nothing wrong with that. Well, yes, there is. There's well, there's nothing wrong with right the, in the that dragon moment, in that, that moment. But there yeah. is something wrong with the fucking heel member of the top heel group, the Blackpool fucking fellowship, comes out to a Raven babyface response against the heel who's been doing dastardly shit, who just finished talking about <laughs> how much perseverance he has and how great a guy his fucking henchman is. And they're, uh, so they're just putting names together so people won't set their televisions on fire at this point. It, but it, the booking still doesn't make any sense, of course, because of all the, you know, not only the, the curves they get thrown with fire and the big star, but also just the positions they have put these guys in where they make a guy heal, even though the people want to cheer him or vice versa. And, and it's just, <sighs> you know, Starks does an incredible fired up promo, whether as a baby face or as a heel, we've seen it enough times. Now he could do it. He's great. 
and it's a short sample size, but I like him and Big Bill together. And Big Bill's improved, and he looks good. Do you think if they wanted to go to WWE and get out of their contract, they should just, like, sneak up behind Tony and, boo, you know, like, scare him? Make him fear for his life? Make him fear for something, now that we've established that's a way to get out of your contract. Well, I don't know how much heat old Big Bill has from when he was there before. Was that because of the little dipshit he was partnered with? That's a good point. I don't know. You know. Speaking of little dipshits, so Moxley was in the back rambling on about pockets, and this was one of his lines. The idiots call him a cosplay wrestler. Well, are any of them the winningest champion in all of pro wrestling? <laughs> of course not. <laughs> <laughs> because nobody else is the boss's pet. Tony Khan can have a chimpanzee win if he wants to. And the, Moxley's doing the promo where he's trying to convince people that our little puppy pockets is the real thing, but he's going to target his soul. Yeah, I, don't believe, and, I don't believe Moxley's the real thing. That's the problem. The yes. promo starts, you're trying to listen to him. Okay, I see what he's doing. But again, by the end of it, I will crush your soul. I will eat yeah. your soul. Whatever the fuck he's talking about. He's going to drink his bones and eat his blood. And Ridiculous. You know, but anyway, so that we got that coming up on the pay-per-view. And then again on Collision, our, our program that we've normally been liking. We can see now the, the change in management. Uh, Daniel Garcia, Daddy Mac, and Cool Hand Luke against the acclaimed and Billy Gunn. The highlight was Caster's rap getting bleeped. Apparently, he went too far even for these people. Did you notice that referee Aubrey Ed had her mane arranged in a brand new style? I did notice did she now that? has her hair down for the first time. Yes, and well, there's still kind of a, there's a thing, you know, her, her mane is braided in the middle with braids and it goes down in the ponytail. Yeah. Uh, this match happened and all three of the baby faces hit Daddy Mac Mac Daddy with each one of them with a move one, two, three. And I think, I think uh, it was during this match, maybe or slightly after it. I don't remember the exact point, but I tweeted out that it's like Dynamite and Rampage had an ugly baby. A very ugly baby. Ugly baby. An ugly child. Took after its mother and its father. And then Ozzy Oldham wrestled Commander and Nick Wayne with Alex. Alex is now managing Nick Wayne and Commander. What did I tell you? It was either earlier in this show or it was the last show we did. Alex comes out with anybody that's from Mexico or has a Mexican gimmick. Isn't that racist? Well, Nick what Wayne the... is uh, from the Pacific Northwest. No, Commander. Well, he's been managing. He's run out there with Commander jumping around a few times now. Ozzy Oldham... Is it racist cover. that Prince Nana doesn't have a lot of white guys in his stable? No, because he's got white guys. If, he, if every black wrestler on the roster had to be managed by Prince Nana as a manner of course, that would be racist. I'm trying to figure the other managers in their fucking stables. That I can't uh, think of uh, right now. Who else manages at AEW? Jake Roberts only manages big, tall, white guys. One big, tall, white guy. Does Jake still work there, actually? I don't even know. We haven't seen him in forever, so who knows? We haven't seen Lance Archer, so... Nevertheless... What, did you see this match? Not much. Um, no, I will make a couple of comments. Uh, the team of Ozzy Oldham looked like a high school kid dressed like a video game character and his unemployed uncle who's on probation. He looks like the Australian Nick Wayne. <laughs> Why are they open? <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question. Um, <laughs> this was instant gymnastics. Uh, you might get this reference. It looks like Matt Rats with a chaperone. Ah, well, that is from where uh, Nick Wayne's from, the Pacific Northwest. Uh, so they had the aggressive choreographed parkour. Commanders the size of a 10-year-old. There was no heat, no story. One move after another back and forth. Nick and, and the young Ozzy did the damnedest swing dance routine you've ever seen. And then did you like the Three Stooges choreography they did where he kept, Nick Wayne kept ducking both of them and they were hitting each other? And then they just caught him with a double team, one, two, three. 
So they beat the teen sensation instead of the meaningless microscopic Mexican. That was that. And then Tony Schiavone gets in the ring with Nick Wayne, who is upset that Darby Allen forgave A.R. Fox, who did all the things he did to him. Darby came out and put Nick over, but said, hey, I forgave A.R. Fox because I got in a fight with your father before he died, and I didn't speak to him. And A.R. Fox was one of my trainers, too, so I had to let it go. Boy, they're really reaching, aren't they? And so Darby wants Nick to be in his corner at the pay-per-view. But then Christian Cage's music plays, and out comes him and Dino, and immediately it got better because Christian was speaking. And he knocked the Blackhawks and said something about sliding into Nick's mom's DMs and threatened Darby and told Nick to bring a towel to throw in. So Christian finished this this bit strong, but it was slow getting there with the other two. I don't know. I'm kind of over Christian's act, to be honest. Just the, I'm going to come out there and say a really outrageous thing. <laughs> How many times is it going to happen? I don't know. But he says it well. Yeah, he says it well. He's performing. We've seen him for enough years that we know this is his new character. See, now you're the one that's getting fucking cranky and fed up with people quick. I am. This is the week I'm cranky and fed up with all of these people. Did you like the interview where Claudio and Wheeler Useless were... were and Claudio actually got an interview, and all he did was give Wheeler the forearms over and over, with, over so that he could prove that every time he gets knocked down, he gets back up. And no. at the end of it, his own fucking partner is goddamn down on the ground in pain. No, I did not like this promo. I don't think Claudio's a particularly good promo. Blackpool Combat Club sucks. Wheeler Yuta doesn't fit. I'm sorry, he's smaller than both of them. And like with the smaller size, there's no muscle mass or anything. There's nothing that makes you think he could stretch you or he's a shooter. <laughs> I mean, we could forget about the whole connection of Blackpool. That's out the fucking window. But Wheeler Yuta, when you see Moxley and Claudio and even Danielson standing there, they work together. I'm not saying I'm a fan of it, but standing next to each other, it works. Wheeler's like, we took someone from the lesser division and we brought him up here. He's our little buddy. <laughs> but we're supposed we, to believe that he can kick some ass in a match. I don't... The lesser... We took somebody from the crowd. Uh, Soraya and Ruby were in the back. Soraya didn't do a bad promo. And Ruby was okay, and they said Tony was in the parking lot throwing shoes at birds. So then we got to the point that we were curious about. Tony Schiavone was in the ring introducing Dennis Rodman. And I wrote, God, this show is rotten. This is collision. This is what we've got so far. This segment. And oh. Rodman came out. Look, I know he's got to be worth $50 million or some ridiculous amount but he looked like a fucking homeless addict that climbed over a wall to escape something what's the that's that's kind of his look and he didn't speak before jeff jarrett's music played and here came jeff and karen and sanjay and lethal and zippy and they cut a promo about rodman being a former nwo member and demanded that he join their group again and this was clearly set up just to antagonize him so he'd do something of some kind. But then apparently, the only person that felt confident in whatever he was going to do was Sanjay, because, and with good reason, Sanjay tells all the heels to get out of the ring, and he demands an answer. So he's two feet shorter than fucking Rodman. And Rodman, being a world-class athlete, grabbed him and somehow awkwardly shoved him down in a fashion. And I don't know. And, and then the acclaim music played and they came out, even though Rodman was in no particular danger and Bowens challenged him right now. But Billy said, no, I can't wrestle twice in one night. So how about tomorrow night? And Rodman can be in our corner. And there were, the fans were just staring at this shit. It wasn't like, oh, our 
our former basketball hero or our wrestling hero or anybody of our heroes. It was like, what the fuck is going on here? What was going on there? Swami's barking. What was going <laughs> on was an NBA legend who has a history with wrestling during its last boom period was brought in. And they immediately shifted to the Jeff Jarrett comedy show. And as soon as you see that, you know what it is. It's just we've seen enough of these segments. I know you like Jeff. But how many of these bad Jeff Jarrett segments do there have to be? My affection is waning. I used to say I, I thought it would be like TNA. It's, it's worse because it's TNA with Tony. It's just not good all of these jeff jarrett segments and it started it was just him and lethal and then they had sanjay then they had the feckless giant and now karen's bored i guess so now she marches out there with him to be a part of what is just the low rent segment of every show i wish we could see jay lethal wrestle that would be so much fun all righty they did a package to tell us more about Shane Taylor, but not much. And Samoa Joe was in the back and did a great, serious heel promo. He talks well. He carries himself well. He's condescending to people beneath him. That was good for a minute. But then we got uh, Baker, Sheeta, and Statlander against Soraya, Storm, and Soso. And Soraya sprayed Britt Baker in the face and Ruby Pender. And I wrote, P Punk's gone one week and Saturday has turned into Wednesday. And we just saw on Payback that Trish Stratus, Becky Lynch cage match. Again, not necessarily something you like, but you could appreciate the effort and the quality of the competitors in there. Rhea Ripley versus Raquel. And then it's this. And then it's these six-man matches with just... It's like they only exist to drive away viewers. Especially the six women matches when they have the six man. Did I matches. say six man again? Fuck. Yes, you did. Trios. Maybe trios is the right word now. We can start using it's well, but gender they, but neutral. They just had an eight man. Does that make it quattros? Uh, a quartet match. Okay, what about a ten man tag like the Stadium Stampede? Is that then? Is that a a a cinco match? Or a sinkhole match. <laughs> Maybe a sinkhole match. Speaking of a sinkhole match, Powerhouse Hobbs was up next against a guy named GPA. And from the looks of him, it didn't stand for grade point average. And one tackle, pancake, one, two, three. And then Miro came to the ring. And they had what was an unfortunately awkward punch exchange, but it was stiff. And Hobbs took a nice bump over the top rope, and they fought on the floor. And then they just kind of separated and walked off. And I was a bit reticent about the idea of Hobbs and Miro on the pay-per-view because of the, the big guys, the big bulls together. Sometimes it, it gets sloppy, but we'll see what happened when we get to that. And we were ready for our main event. Jay White and Dax. So again, how many weeks has it been that if it wasn't for Gin and Juice or FTR or Punk or actually I'll put the Gun Boys in there too, they wouldn't have had a main event. But they've had some of the best main events on wrestling television lately. But how long before that comes to an end too? Now that we're hearing the the brand split will be unsplit and join back together and what tony has joined together let no punk rend asunder i wonder if anyone's gonna have a problem with that who didn't expect to work a second day no matter what side you're on if you expected to only work wednesdays and now it's like well well we fired that guy you had a problem with we kind of expect you to show up on saturdays now well too. i've got no problem for the money these guys are making with people being asked to work two days a fucking week but i wonder if any of the people that thought they were over on saturday to be serious and get a push and get over away from all the foolishness and the children will be upset that they're going back to a clown show format instead of wrestling look it's over whatever collision was going to be and it was for most of each episode that's, I think, done now. Yeah. It's now just going to be more dynamite. 
Well, anyway, speaking of dynamite, this match was good. It was snug. It was crisp. They both can work. I like Jay White's work a lot better than his promos. To be honest, I think Juice ought to be the stick man for that team. But they went through a couple of breaks. They kept it interesting. They had the people interested. They had, you know, the false finishes, the back and forth, blah, blah, blah. And finally, with the heels distracting, uh, the, Jay White hit his finish on Dax on the floor and then rolled him in, but Dax got a jackknife for a two count. And then suddenly Jay White hit his finish again and got a three count. But then the heels jumped cash and the buckaroos came out for the save and were booed out of the arena for saving the baby faces. And that was, unfortunately, our favorite wrestling show or what used to be our favorite wrestling show of the week, ladies and gentlemen. And like you said, uh, I believe it was on the special edition or maybe it was earlier. It must have been on the special edition. After they went off the air, the Bucks took a victory lap in the ring in front of a Half empty house. Yes, uh, that that was someone retweeted that. Who was it? I believe it was Vince McMahon's thoughts. But uh, somebody said this is classic way for them to end Punk's tenure in the company by taking a victory lap in the ring in a in an empty arena in front of a bunch of people who booed him out of the building. So there, that was that. That was collision. We collided with that. What in the world is going on in your world this week, young Brian? Look, I'm so tired and we have so much more to talk about. We've watched so much shit the last few days. Go through everything on Twitter at Super Podcast, Facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. The wrestling news with all this shit happening. How do you keep up all? How do you keep up with? I can't even talk. How do you keep up with all of it? Without opinion and conjecture. <laughs> you do it with the wrestling news, the wrestling news.com. Look for Arcadian Vanguard's The Wrestling News. Look for all the other shows. And, of course, the 605 Super Podcast. The Mothership! 605 Pod. Hey! 605pod.com or go through the archive today. Also, actually, I do want to make mention, shut up and wrestle with Brian Solomon this week. He goes through his archives, an interview with Terry Funk that he conducted a few years ago. And I'm trying to, while you were saying that, I was trying to find my notes for this next and final program that we're going to talk about this week. Thank God. The AEW, all, is were they all in or all out? All out of options? All out of jobs? It was all, all out, out of ideas? A variety so, of all outs. All out, again on September 3rd, in the Chicago United Center that they were just in the previous night. This time... They had about 10,000 people in the place because it was a pay-per-view and the tickets went on sale months ago. And when with AEW running the Chicago United Center, one would imagine that everybody that bought a ticket, whether they bought it for him or not, pretty much assumed they were going to be seeing CM Punk. Would you think that's not the case, Brian? I would think anyone who bought a ticket within the last two months minus the last week thought that CM Punk was going to be there and more than likely in one of the featured matches. Yes, and then they find out the day before that he's not going to be, and there was a smaller crowd for Saturday night for Collision. They weren't happy. And then they have 10,000 people come and see. So you heard what they did before the pay-per-view when everybody was coming in, right, with the shirts? I've seen several reports of this, and it seems so ridiculous that I almost, like, I want visual confirmation. It just seems preposterous in Chicago, with all of this happening, that they'd be confiscating shirts or signs. Well, they, they, weren't, they weren't able to take people's shirts away. They were confiscating the signs. But if you came with a CM Punk sign, they would take it away. And if you came wearing a CM Punk t-shirt, they would make you turn it inside out or deny you entry to the building. And think about this, on that whole pay-per-view in Chicago, in the United Center, and this is the hottest topic, not only in the company, but in wrestling, did you see a CM Punk t-shirt? I thought I did. I actually thought I saw a few. That's why I was surprised when I saw these reports come out. I didn't, you didn't see any CM Punk signs, did you? Except for the one guy in the front row that said, Tony Khan cured cancer. They made sure to leave that one. No, there was another sign I saw... I don't know if it was Collision. I thought it was the pay-per-view. It said, cry me a river. And then someone, it almost looked like they wrote in after the fact, CM Punk. 
Maybe because they couldn't get the sign in if it said CM Punk. But I don't know. I mean, that's that's it. He's he their biggest no merch mover. Signs. He's their biggest merch mover, I believe, up until, you know, they fired him. I'm guessing they can't sell his merch anymore. But, you know, WWF got killed in the Observer by those readers years ago for when they would make people who showed up in a Four Horsemen shirt. Like, you had to switch that shirt. You could not sit within camera view in a Crockett promotion shirt. And that's what Tony Khan's doing now. Well, except, I'm sure except now they're his own shirts. That's the funniest yeah. part. Well, now it's going to be in the in the Observer. It's going to be oh, he was just trying to keep the peace amongst the locker room by letting not letting the fans stir stuff up or some shit. But anyway, so they thought they might be safe. The first match on the pay per view: MJF and Adam Cole against the Dork Order, Little Brutus and Long John Silver, and Pizzeria Uno was in the corner also in his ridiculous clown outfit. So now it's Chicago, it's the United Center, is the, the scene of one of their greatest triumphs before, and the people have bought tickets for a pay-per-view. They don't get to see Punk at all, and MJF, the other biggest, hottest guy in the company, is in the opening match in a joke tag team match just for storyline that they could have done on television. I'm telling you, they killed the city of Chicago. So anyway, Kevin Kelly said over 10,000 fans have filled the United Center. He should have said a half filled. It seats 20,000. You shouldn't say fill. You should say over 10,000 fans have converged on the United Center. It sounds good, but it's still not a lion. Anyway, the, this was, they did the comedy at first. And the, MJF had the crowd in the palm of his hand, milking the comedy stuff. And, uh, you know, that's great. He doesn't have to take any bumps. But then he sells his neck on a tackle and rolls out. And it's like supposedly he's got a stinger or the bad neck from Wembley. And then the heel hits him with a chair in the back of the neck. And everything stops. And the doctor's checking. And nothing is happening. And the referee's not counting. And I see what they were trying to do. They were trying to instill some kind of mystery in the finish. Will the dork order beat these guys? Because, you know, MJF's taken out of the match or whatever. But no. You shouldn't be doing an angle with the hottest star in the company and job guys. Or with Adam Cole with two of the hottest stars in the company and job guys. Nobody bought it. Nobody cared because they knew Either he's going to come back or Adam's going to do something's going to, it's all going to turn out all right. The dork order is not suddenly going to kill Adam Cole and MJF. And then they had to get five minutes of heat on Cole two on one where the people had died down before finally MJF comes back out with the referees on his tail and everything and the people woke up. And then Adam Cole gets the tag and the crowd explodes, but the crowd would have exploded if he'd got the tag to MJF, if MJF had been in the corner the whole time. Because it's the dork order. They just want to see MJF do the fucking kangaroo kick and the double clothesline. And that's what they did. And they won one, two, three. But it, do you see what I'm saying is that why go to that much trouble for this insignificant preliminary match. Your thoughts? I paid attention to it because of the MJF angle or, you know, tease during the match of the neck injury. But other than that, no, look, it's the Dark Order. They both look like they should be working at Dairy Barn. I'm not interested in watching them. I just Do you still have Dairy Barn? Uh, on Long Island, I'm still Dairy Barn. Son of a bitch. Not many left, though, but it was a wonderful convenience just to be able to pull right up and Hey, can I get a gallon of 1%? Can I get some eggs? Can I get some Cheetos? Get the fuck out of there. Pull right up to a barn and get your dairy. Well, as I was saying, I didn't give a shit about this match. Uh, I just wanted to see what was going to happen with MJF and Cole, and if Roddy Strong would show up or anything, so... And, and nobody did. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nothing... so, you know, just... I guess it's a central theme. I don't necessarily think matches are just good if they just have lots and lots of kickouts. <laughs> like I don't see that as skill not that it's not a skill to constantly do that physically but 
there's a lot of things that people rave about just because people kick out nonstop of everything. And again, it doesn't necessarily even apply to this match in that sense, but that's all the Dark Order could do. You know they're not going to win, so it's just about them getting near falls. But no, no. Why, why are these guys still there? Uno! Why the fuck did anybody ever give him a job, much less he keep it? I, I mean, we know, that's a rhetorical question, he's friends with the buckaroos, but Seriously, there's serious people in the business that deserve a break. They've never been seen before. And this fucking guy, just dreck, just the state of him. Anyway. Well, he's got the right friends, but anyway. So MJF and Cole are leaving the ring and Samoa Joe's entrance starts. Of course, it always happens that music starts playing before the previous match gets out of the way yet. But you'll never guess, but Joe and MJF had a a little set to where Joe shoved him out of the way and got in the ring, and then MJF hit the ring and jumped on Joe. Joe front face locked him. Security came in, pulled him apart. Joe was taunting MJF, so now we've we've got a glimpse in something that's going to take the place of Punk's rivalry with Samoa Joe, and that maybe, it, hopefully, it'll be MJF. That could be interesting. MJF needs a fresh opponent. Yes. And there aren't too many there because he's kind of exhausted the matches we want to see with him against a Moxley or a Jericho or various other people. Again, I always fear the Orange Cassidy match coming. But him and Joe is intriguing. That was the highlight of the whole opening match for me was just that moment. As soon as Joe's music hit, you said, oh, no, they're not going to. <laughs> and then they tease it. And MJF going to the ring and firing up against Joe may be the best moment he's had as a traditional babyface. Yeah, because the people were just, he wasn't, he didn't go in there and poke him in the eye and do his heel stuff. He went in there and started fighting him, and the people, oh, he's got a gumption. I want to see that. I want to see that. You know, I said the other day I wanted to see MJF versus Roddy Strong one time to see what that's like, but MJF and Joe, if it's not just a, if it's a one-off match, it's intriguing. If it's more than that, it's really intriguing. Babyface MJF versus a heel Samoa Joe. And like they could talk. That. Yeah. Oh, they could talk. But Joe didn't, he let his actions do his talking for him up against Shane Taylor for the Ring of Honor World TV title. And obviously, this was to get Joe on the card and give him a win. Nothing against Shane Taylor, but as we, may, we never even heard of him until last week. They announced the match and played a couple of highlights. And... He's a bigger guy, so this was a big man fight. They were chopping hard, punching hard. Uh, there wasn't a lot of response because the crowd did not know Shane Taylor. But it was hard, and it was snug, and it was serious. And I would say if I was critiquing Shane Taylor, he needs to watch the obvious slaps on his strikes, and the boxing shorts are not flattering. And then after they had a nice little... Meat slapper, uh, Joe got the coquina clutch and got the tap out. And that was what that was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can't All add right. to The first time I've seen Shane Taylor, didn't do anything wrong. It was fine for what it was. Do you, do you see the shorts are a little off-putting? Yeah, well, they're very baggy. They're very, very baggy. Very baggy, yeah. And seem to be needed to be pulled up a lot. All right. Speaking of baggy, uh, Darby Allen came to the ring with his baggage, Nick Wayne, now that he's adopted him, apparently, for the TNT title match with Dino Douche with Christian Cage in the corner. And they brought Jim Ross in for commentary on this one and, and a couple more. They were trading out the announcers. And here we go with Darby. And everybody thinks I'm going to eviscerate this because the fucking goofy lizard is in it. This is the best that I've seen him, I think. Now, the problem is still the booking and the way this was put together, but the big fucker, as awkward as he is when he's got a little guy to throw around, he looks impressive. But the, the, the match, Darby jumps on him, has a big flurry, they go to the floor within 30 seconds, and they stay there. And Dino takes over. The corpse referee was involved, so he was useless. And 
the match is not, the bell is not rung yet. So Dino runs Darby into the stairs and he's busted open and he's bleeding and he turns the, the metal stairs over on top of him and walks up the stairs to get back in the ring. Well, by the time this all happens, they've been on the floor for three minutes and they've done a great angle. It was a nice angle for a match. Their Darby was attacked. He's busted open and bleeding and banged into the stairs. The stairs turned over on top of him, a 300-pound man walking on top of the stairs. That's a great angle. They should come back and book a match out of that for when Darby recovers. But instead, they've already done the angle for the match. They've already got the match. That's the way they started it, and now they have to have a match. And what... Darby sells great, but part of it is they're really hurting him. But I understand the psychology of, again, of putting the small, vulnerable baby face in jeopardy and then showing how plucky he is in the fight against the bigger guy, but not when you destroy the guy at the start and then start the match and start the fight against the bigger guy. Then it's just ridiculous. Is it not? Eh, I mean, there's so much ridiculous to go around on this show. And you know, they have a good match after that, after he's already killed his opponent and he should never walk again. But that's a Dar then, that has to be a Darby thing because we've seen that before, haven't we, in his yeah, matches? Uh, yes, constantly. So anyway, um, Christian tried to give uh, Nick Wayne the towel to throw in, but Darby hit Christian with a dive. And, you know, the people were into it. They liked Darby. When they went into false finishes, it's just that I know, like I said, he sells well, and part of it is they're really hurting him. And he's, it's not a joke. It's not something to be, you know, laughing about, but his career is not going to last long because he's going to hurt himself bad because he obviously doesn't care. He said he doesn't care. But then the finish is Christian hits Nick Wayne with a chair and distracts Darby by like he's going to concerto Nick Wayne. So then Dino catches Darby and gives him two tombstones in a row and a clothesline to beat him. One, two, three, the 300 pound man, two tombstones and a clothesline after a 15 minute match, after the guy was left laying in a puddle of his own blood before the match started. One, two, three. And then they were going to give him the concerto, but all the job guys ran in to stop him. It just, <clears throat> You're going to have to fire this kid out of a cannon in six months to get anybody to pop because what else are you going to do to him? And it's, it's infringing on his good-natured absorption of all this punishment that he feels like he has to take. But I would, again, if there was some structure in the company, you could use that drive, determination, and talent he has for not killing himself every single time he does this shit and control it and use it when it meant the most. And you could get the most out of it. But I digress. Moving along? Moving along. I agree with you. You know, I like it when you just agree with me and don't interrupt me. I hate your singing. All right. I knew it couldn't all be positive. Miro versus Hobbs. It was another big man fight uh, in the vein of Samoa Joe and Shane Taylor, but both these guys honestly look better and are physically and are more mobile than Taylor was. Plus, and, the, plus the crowd helped make this. Well, plus the crowd knows who they are. And Miro has more experience. So, nevertheless, punches, kicks, and clotheslines were the order of the day. And they just, they had a slobber knocker and it was serious and it was stiff and they worked hard and the people were with it. As I recall, Hobbs is the heel and Miro's the baby face, but you can't tell either by the match they had or their appearance, but they just fought each other. And Hobbs took another great bump over the top rope, different kind of way than he did on television. But there were 
there were great pops for the big spine busters and the big power moves and people got into it. And I must admit, it was much better than I was afraid it was going to be with two big smash mouth guys. It might be awkward or clumsy or whatever, but this was a good fight that the people liked. And I swear to God, they almost had it. And then Hobbs goes for the camel clutch, which Miro calls the Redeemer. He was going to give his give him his own finish, but Miro slipped out of it and got his own. And he had cranked back once, and then Hobbs is still green. And so I don't fault him, but it was just unfortunate. When Miro cranked up the first time, he's got it, and you saw Hobbs's hand go up, he was going to tap. But Miro didn't want him to tap so quick. He wanted to keep it on the big man for a minute. So you see him put Hobbs's hand back down like not now. And then he had it for a second. And as Miro goes to adjust his grip to really do the crank back, Hobbs put his hand up there and tapped again. So he tapped on the guy when he was adjusting the hole. And it was I was like, oh, man. You know, Hobbs is going to be great. This is the best he's had a chance to be. I think in terms of the longest match with, you know, motivation and uh, an angle behind it. But he he's he's still a little green and he didn't there was a mistiming there. And I don't even know if you saw that, but that's the first thing I saw. What was the first thing you saw? There was well, not the first thing. It was the last thing because it was the finish. But the first thing I saw about the finish was it was obvious to me that Hobbs was trying to tap too quick and tapped on Miro when he was adjusting the hold, not even when he was cranking it. Yeah, that kind of flattened me. I thought it was a good match, though. And again, the crowd, although I wouldn't be sitting there chanting "meat" or whatever the fuck. They were going slap meat or chop meat or beat meat or. Something of that yeah, nature. It's one of those things where you can't tell if they're even reacting to the specific wrestlers or the match more just like they've decided this is their thing. <laughs> they're going to cheer meat tonight. But good. I'm happy they didn't have QT out there with Hobbs. That's a big positive. Aha, that was a plus. I didn't miss him in more ways than one. And then Lana coming out or, or CJ with her own Titan Tron. Well, I was going to get to that a second. Oh, okay, go ahead. Well, it was just after the the match. That's what we were commenting on the they had it all the way till then. And then they shook hands. And I'm thinking, "Oh, well, what the And then Miro goes to leave and Hobbs jumps him from behind. So now we know who the heel is. He's getting some heat. But then he gets on Miro and he was punching the ground beside Miro's head. Did you see that? That hurt my I feelings. I did. I saw. It was not good. And he need as big, as impressive as he is and as he looks, he's got to do. If he can't throw a punch, don't get down on the guy and throw him. Level the fucking guy and then drop an elbow or pick him up and slam him or put him over the ropes and choke him with a maniacal look. But don't throw phony punches if you're a 300-pound guy and you hit like a girl or don't hit at all. But anyway, that's when music played, and on the screen popped up the words hot and flexible. And I know Miro in the promos has talked about his goddamn double-jointed wife, but she's not ever appeared on this program. This was a surprise. She's running in to save her husband from something that if this was a shoot, she wouldn't have known was going to happen. But she took time to have her goddamn hot and flexible graphic queued up on the Titan Tron and music. And when she came out, she posed for the people while her husband was getting assassinated. And then she charges to the ring and gets a chair and slides in the ring. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, certainly to God, he's not going to sell this. And he didn't. She hits Hobbs with the chair across the back. And he stands up and turns around and snatches the chair away from her. And then they he stares at her. And she's kind of backing up, but really they're they're not really moving. And he stares at her for so fucking long, it gets phony. 
And then Miro picks up the chair and hits him in the back. He should have snatched her. He doesn't have to hit her, but he should have snatched her. Can you imagine the ooh when that fucking 300-pound giant muscle-bound monster snatches that goddamn 120-pound little five-foot-tall girl by the hair and just draws back? Everybody, ah, oh, and then he gets hit by the chair. But standing there, it just made him look stupid. Because, I'm sorry, if a woman hits me with a chair, I'm, I'm punching her in the fucking face. Sorry. I'll apologize now. But anyway, then Miro hit the hit him with the chair over the head and Powerhouse bailed out. And then Miro, everybody's cheering, thinking they're going to hug. And Miro looks at his wife and gets mad at her and leaves. So now he's mad at her. He, he's not mad at God anymore. He's mad at his wife for saving his ass when he was getting his ass kicked. And his wife, by the way, doesn't have a name yet because the other one was trademarked. So, good match. And then what the fuck is this angle? Is this going to be more of this weird psychological shit where he's mad at his wife because she's double-jointed and saved him and made him sad? I don't know what the fuck. What would this be about? Oh, I don't know, and I don't think anyone else does. I just want to see Miro kick ass and have kick ass matches, but he keeps going back to this fight with God and dark rooms and light rooms that he's broadcasting his promos from, and now hot and flexible. A surprise run in, a surprise run in to save her husband after shaking the hand of Powerhouse Hobbs. Hobbs surprisingly turned on him. Little did he know that Lana was prepared with Titantron. She comes out there, she has music, she has a screen. <laughs> She's wearing an outfit. If I was going to go save someone in a fight, that's not the outfit I'd be wearing. I wouldn't have done the thing where Hobbs went to hit her. I think that's a step too far in 2023. You get in trouble. Well, then don't do it at all. Don't have a 120-pound woman I hit a with fucking 300-pound guy with a chair if you don't want the 300-pound guy to do what he would naturally really do if it really happened. I think it's one thing if Hobbs had a woman in his corner who as soon as Lana came in the room with the chair, they can go at it. But I agree with you on that. She shouldn't have done that. And then, again, we're teasing now the Miro-Lana feud. Can't wait to see that match. Clearly, she's afraid of nothing. She ran in there to tap and said, screaming Hobbs. like, you turn around, you son of a bitch. I'm going to... You're going to do nothing and like it, Missy. It's interesting, though. The fans there knew who she was. You know, the fans there knew who she was off being on WWE TV a few years ago. I don't know if the yes. roles were reversed, if, they, if a WWE fan would recognize someone from AEW that had been in a similar position. I, I would bet money that you're correct about that as well. Next up was Ruby Soso and our girl, Chris Statlander. And as much as I like Statlander, she's got the size, better look now. She's serious. Her work is improving. On the other hand, Ruby does a lot of awkward, odd things. And we were running late. So Soraya drew the referee and Ruby got the paint can, but Tony Storm came out from under the ring. And once she found Ruby, she took the paint can from her and Ruby turned around into a tombstone one, two, three. See, the tombstone still works on the girls. You don't have to give them two and then hit them with a clothesline. Yes, you do. It depends on who you're up against. Ruby's not the opponent for that. Well, although Ruby is the same size as Darby Allen, same body weight at least, so... Ruby's not, um... Statlander's good and getting better. I'll just say that. Yes, let's say that. All right, you're wondering, was there anything worth our attention on this program? And the answer is yes, and it came up next. The strap match between Ricky Starks and Brian Danielson. And I've got to admit that I was, you know, zoned out on a lot of this stuff, and I wasn't really looking forward to Punk being replaced in this issue or anything about any of this. But they worked their ass off here. and. You know, it, Starks, as we said in the collision talk, was is motivated. He He's going to goddamn get over, uh, no matter what he has to do, uh, uh, no matter how many of these things gets jerked out from under him, but Danielson coming back. And yes, we mentioned that a strap match may be easier with a bad arm than a regular style Danielson match, but he can do all of these. That's why he's been hidden for so long 
in that goofy group with that stupid, bald, fucking garbage wrestler Moxley and that fucking ridiculous whole gimmick where you saw less of Danielson than you did of everybody else and he's the one that you wanted to see, that it's nice to see him. Again, he's had a couple of runs where he was at one point, he was the best heel in the company. One point, he was the best baby face. If he's got something to do, he can do it. He just, uh, Danielson has no, I'm going to put my foot down and not associate or be associated with this stupid booking or this crummy group or this nonsensical whatever. And he, he excels at periods of time and then gets shoved into something that he won't say no to. Nevertheless, I like this best of anything. And from the Ricky Starks jumping Danielson at the start, before Aubrey Ed could hook the reins up to him, um, and he attacked Danielson before the bell and whipped him with the weight belt and busted him open with a punch with the buckle, and Danielson got good color. And then when they got in the ring, started the match, and again, this pre-match attack worked. So Darby and Dino didn't have done, shouldn't have done the one they did. Because this worked, and it's a gimmick match, and it's two main event guys, and there's an issue of some description. So anyway, Danielson sells great, fights back great, and then when he takes over, he whipped the shit out of Starks. People were into this. There was and then Starks was bleeding. And Danielson was whipping him more. They kept it moving. There was hard contact. The blood seemed called for in this, not fake or goofy or like within two minutes when Moxley does it for no reason. Or, you know, the typical garbage indie shit. This was an extension of what they were doing, I thought. And then... You know, they did, did a big one-two yay-boo with the strap whips, and Danielson bowed up and just kicked the shit out of Starks. And then when Big Bill tried to interfere, Steamboat was up off of color and grabbed Bill and punched him and chopped him, and then Danielson wiped him out with a dive, and then they did a couple of big false finishes. And then finally Danielson hit the stomps and got the label lock, and Starks was able to break it once, so Danielson wrapped the strap around his neck and basically choked Starks out. Starks made a great face. He didn't tap. He passed out. And again, I always say about these immobile finishes, just when it's some cold match with some goof that wants to be in his fantasies, an MMA star or a badass, and you're immobile in the ring for a minute, and then somebody just taps, that's bullshit. It's not exciting. But when they did, they built this up from the label lock crossface to then wrapping the strap around his neck and choking him literally until near death, almost to David Carradine levels of chokingness. That I'll buy if they're in the same place, because something was going on. So this was... To me, this was the best thing on the show, and it wasn't even really close with the other stuff. What'd you think? I thought Takeshita versus Omega was better. What? Um, yeah, I think this match, you know, I know everyone's raving about this match. This match didn't do it for me. Just having eh. arbitrary violence. There is no feud. Danielson hasn't been there. He's had no program with Ricky Starks. Their first interaction was the night before, where the heel came back to save the babyface Ricky Steamboat. And in general, I'm not a strap match fan, to be fair. But just watching these guys stand there while the other one whips the other one, and then just, I don't know, just watching Ricky Stark's face while he submits, it seems like that's the thing people like, the brutality, and then feigning that he could almost die. But I don't I, know. Everyone liked, loved it. I'm the only one. I'm the only well, one. I'm telling you I now. liked it because there was some legitimate violence here, or legitimate-looking violence, which is so rare these days, especially from the, this bunch. And... And just the, they didn't fuck up a stipulation for once. They didn't fuck the whole thing up. They didn't make it clown showy. Um, they tried to do it seriously. So I gave them points for that. Yeah, I'm not saying it was bad or anything, but there were people raving about it like it's the greatest strap match of all time. And I don't think it's... 
Yeah, I don't. I and I don't think it's that. But I also, you know, again, I, I, I don't know. I haven't been into Danielson that much in a while. I like a few matches. Well, here there's and there. been no reason to. I'm talking about when he wrestled. Yeah. But this match, I'm the only one though. I'm the only one. Everyone else loved it. Well, at least you admit it. Yeah. So you you recognize your shortcomings. You're going to do something about them. No, I'd rather just be able to stand over here in the corner, point at everyone, and say it's all you, not me. Well, that's another way of looking at it. So speaking of another way of looking at things, Claudio and Useless versus Kingston and Shibata. We could look at it or we couldn't. I determined, again, I'm running fucking late. And I briefly saw Claudio doing the phony BBC elbows like the rest of them, so I assume now they've ruined his work also. I knew there was going to be some comedy material in here, but I, I can't... Out of nowhere, Claudio hit Kingston with a European uppercut, one, two, three. And a people kind of farted. Did, were they farting at the rest of the match, or did you notice? Well, let me just say, I never know what to say about this, because whenever I think the crowd is dead, people tell me that the crowd is fully engaged. I guess it's like some mixture of a 1970s Japanese wrestling crowd with a call-and-response crowd from a, from a church. I really don't know what it's <laughs> supposed to be. I saw people said this match was really good. Uh, I even saw Dave Meltzer said like another excellent oh. match or whatever it was. Well, of course he did. And I'm watching it like, man, I don't see it at all. And that's where there's just a complete disconnect with a certain fan base and people like me. And there's a lot of people like me out there, as we know. Nobody's like you. You're one of a kind, Brian. Well, the next contest that came up on the AEW All Out pay-per-view extravaganza was one that you just claimed that you liked better than this strap match. And I've got to admit, it was not as bad as I was feared it might be because Harpo kept himself under control and didn't do a lot of the really egregiously phony or silly or stupid shit that he's known for. He's even got his faces somewhat under control. You know, because they used to make that face that reminded us of when his butt plug would fall out unexpectedly. But it was, of course, Twinkle Toes McFinger Bang taking on our friend from the land of the rising sun, Mr. Take-A-Shit, with his manager, Don Fallis. So, why does Kenny Olivier still get the pompous heel ring introduction when he's a babyface? Where Smiley Roberts has to give the over-the-top description of all of his accolades and things that he's done and blah 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 and you know, he's a baby face now the other guy has turned on him the other guy was their friend you know how big that is for these guys was their friend and turned and joined don's evil group so if twinkle toes is coming out as the baby face why is he still being announced like he's a pompous arrogant obnoxious heel it has nothing to do with baby face or heel. It's just all about that inside joke. Okay, well, it's good we got that cleared up. As I said, this wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. They wrestled at the start. And Take a Shit gave Kenny a belly to back and almost dropped him on his head. I don't know whether that was a botch or supposed to be that way. And they, they did go to the floor, but they waited the uh, four whole minutes before they fought on the floor. And then, of course, Twinkle Toes just took over out of nowhere and started doing moonsaults off the railing or whatever. But, and then he got the Indian death lock and they reenacted his, one of his favorite scenes from Sissy Boy Slap Fight. Look that up on the internet, people. If you think I'm messing with you, Tyson Smith is in the cast listing. Sissy Boy Slap Fight. Anyway. I wrote that Take a Shit needs uh, to follow through on his arm whips. He's getting a little Vader like with those. But he looks like a star. I like this guy, and he's very athletic. And, you know, this was a modern style match where he gave Kenny a brain buster on the floor that looked great and then turned around instead of trying to roll him in the ring to beat him, he started pulling chairs out from under the ring and went to use one, drew it back over his head so the referee could take it away. But while the referee was dealing with take-a-shit and the chair that he'd pulled away from him, 
Don on the outside takes four chairs, four of them, and stacks them on Kenny's stomach, and Kenny doesn't move them off. So that Tate can do a senton onto the chairs on Kenny on his stomach. And then they got heat on Kenny. Everything that Kenny does annoys me. Whether it's his odd movements or his weird faces or whatever it is, everything that he does, every move he makes, I just don't like this human being. But finally, he did a dive and gesticulated his way through a comeback and hit a couple of his begonia suplexes, I'm the marigold suplexes, or the snapdragon suplexes. That's it. And it started dragging for me, and I know the people were liking it, but they will not go home. They have to do, as you said, false finish after false finish. And then, this was not a street fight, right? This was not Falls Count Anywhere, not a street fight, not Texas Death. It wasn't no DQ. So Don leaves the screwdriver where Take can find it. And as Kenny picks him up like he's going to give him the one-winged fairy, Take a shit draws the screwdriver back like he's going to stab Kenny in the head. And the referee grabs the screwdriver and takes it away from him. Isn't that, when you see someone attempting to stab someone, isn't that a disqualification? It should be, and I'm not a fan of any of the screwdriver stuff. And then they did more false finishes. And the fans were into them, but there was more of them. And then take a shit, hit a knee lift with his pad down, the little V-trigger thing that Kenny does that's the shittiest... Where's Mr. Wrestling 2 when you need him? That was a fucking knee lift. This, the, this, oh, come the guy... on. That's, that's ridiculous. Oh, come on. Omega, guy... Omega's knees look good. The guy can take no bump. He's already on his knees. He he smashes him into the ropes with him. I, if I'm going to see somebody hit a knee lift, I want to see the guy raised up in the air and fucking whoosh. Or like Bobby Eaton used to take the bump for Wrestling 2, spinning around in a fucking circle. Or something. That was Bobby Eaton. Wrestling 2's knee lift looked like shit by that point. All right. Then. Okay, then Bobby Eaton taking a knee lift from anybody. That's what I want to see. Not this fucking... And as I wrote, as usual, they do a thousand false finishes, and it ends on the simplest move done, the least impressive strike, the least impressive bump. 25 fucking minutes. For a Kenny match, it wasn't bad. I love Take a Shit, and that's why I I tolerated it, because I see something in him. But I didn't think this was as good as the strap match. I'm sorry. I thought it was a good match. Best match of the show uh, to me. Hate the screwdriver stuff. It's unnecessary. It's unneeded. Plus, everyone has a screwdriver. We know that the handles aren't that gigantic. So it's <laughs> silly. And um, beyond that, I think Takeshita... You know, I watched this match for him, not Omega. Not that I have a problem with Omega against him, but it was really, I want to see him in this spot as a big singles match on the show. He continues to impress. And when you see that footage of him just a few years ago, let alone when he first started, but just a couple of years ago, he's still filling out, it seems like. Yeah, he's getting bigger and he's going to mature. And I, I think they, he's got a lot of upset. And the next match had upside and downside. It was a Quattro's match. Not the trios, but the quattros. The Guns and Gin and Juice, Bullet Club Gold against the Buckaroos and FTR. And again, they're, they're trying to create some story between the Buckaroos and FTR. Will they get along? Well, they kind of did, but maybe they won't next time. This was the wrong place for it. You've got heels that are charismatic here in the guns and gin and juice people especially i think like juice um and then the people love ftr but this was the the two people on the roster besides tony khan himself the two people on the roster that the fans decided were the reason why they weren't seeing cm punk was the fucking kookamonga kids rightfully so 
And so FTR got big cheers and the the buckaroos got booed out of the building, not only on their entrance, but when they would get in the ring, it didn't matter what was going on. The people, until they pretty much got fucking smart to it and quit getting in the ring by themselves, there was always somebody else. But whenever the bucks were in the ring, just steady boos, loud, just fuck you. And... And I don't blame them, I, honestly, besides the whole punk thing. Half of this match could have been a rematch of the best tag team match ever held, and they put four more guys in to get it get in the way of that. And the guns worked their ass off, so they fit too, but the buckaroos didn't fit visually, athletically, and the people didn't want to fucking see them. And them standing next to FTR looks like hey, bring your kids to work day. The people have seen through them now. And, but they had to have their referee, the corpse referee was involved in this because they have to have this guy because he lets them do whatever they want. They were controlled as, as much as they could be because FTR and either the guns or gin and juice, they do great wrestling and great spots. And there would be something good going on. And then the buckaroos got in to do the sloppy gymnastics and the crowd booed them like they were Dominic Mysterio. And then it would continue like that back and forth. And they tried at some points to do the deal where the partners switch, where, Maddie would help Dax with the big rig or Cash would help one of the buckaroos with something or whatever, but eh, the fans booed little Nikki's comeback. And the whole comeback was the buckaroos' ridiculous choreographed tumbling, concluding with Nick doing his backflip off the apron that he's done in every match he's had since 2006 and went straight over the top of Juice Robinson, missed every goddamn bit of him. So I liked a lot of this, but then it, it degenerated at the end with the Bucks involved again to what usually happens with their matches. It didn't make sense. There was a big eight-way schmoz going on, and then suddenly you looked around and there was Dax and Jay alone in the ring trading chops. And then finally, out of nowhere, Jay hit his finish on Cash and Colton pinned him one, two, three. So FTR do another job. But it was good action whenever the Lollipop Guild wasn't involved, but I, you couldn't get a flow going. That's what I saw. What'd you see? This was not good to me. It was not a match you want to see from FTR. I hate the shit, and this is a Bucks thing. Although I'm sure FTR were happy to go along with it. Everyone does the same move at the same time. Guys who don't traditionally do the other guy's finishers all of a sudden are just ready to do it. Guys who don't team up with each other are ready to do the moves together. Yeah. I hate it. It's so, <laughs> it's just lame. And, you know, Omega got a big reaction and he's treated like a big star. How did he not get any of this on him with that crowd, even in Chicago? That's what I'm saying. You know, we've talked about the Bucks don't mean today what they used to mean. I always say when they're attached to Omega, they're safe. There was a reason why it was like, we'll only go to the WWE if we all sign together. Yeah, there's a, <laughs> it's a reason for that. But when they're on their own, we've all seen everything they do. The cocky little slappable faces that they make just makes you want to go for them, doesn't it? It would work if they use that to be effective heels, which yeah. they didn't. And now they're ineffective baby faces because they're teaming up with the babyface tag team against the heels, and they don't come across well as babyfaces. They've had horrible character development. Obviously, based on their crappy YouTube show, they have very poor standards or sensibilities when it comes to entertainment or comedy or just trying to do any acting. So no, it shouldn't be any surprise. Omega doesn't get it on them. Even Adam Page gets less of it on them than the Bucks. And also, people know... I think the general AEW fan wants to close their eyes and think Adam Page really would get a beer with them. Kenny Omega really would sit down and play some video games with them. I think even they know, yeah, the Young Bucks are kind of fucking dicks. <laughs> well, 
I thought, okay, at least we got one good match on this pay-per-view. Decent main event, eight-man, whatever. And then I was suddenly informed that wasn't the whole show. And I'm thinking, what the fuck? Wait. That's not the main event. The main event was Pockets and the Plumber. <coughs> Again, I say this, and this drove it home. These people paid for tickets to an AEW pay-per-view at the United Center in Chicago. And we know they thought they were going to see CM Punk. We know they thought they were going to see MJF involved in some kind of big-time match. We know they probably had expectations of seeing some of their favorites in AEW. But do you think when anybody bought any of these tickets sight unseen to a pay-per-view, they thought that they were going to see a main event of Pockets versus Plumber Moxley? I think not. And by the way, guess what happened? I, I'm not shitting you on this, Brian. This is not hyperbole and exaggeration for comedic effect as soon as they popped up the graphic that said pockets versus plumber for the a and p title or whatever my dvr froze not because it was out of time it froze up and went to a black screen and then the clock disappeared off the front of it and it said boot it was for whatever reason <laughs> it automatically went into reboot mode and it took 10 minutes to go through the rebooting process so that I could go back to the pro. It was trying to tell me for my own good, Jim, you don't want to see this. And it was right. A balding plumber challenged the company mascot for a meaningless title belt in the main event of the second pay-per-view that they have done in seven days, eight days. And they expected people to pay for this or in whatever method they bought this, purchased this, or streamed this, and accept that. Talk about Seth Franklin Rollins and Shaky Nakamura not being a pay-per-view main event. What the... F is Tony's not only lost his balls that he possibly never had, he's lost his mind. It, that this was on the card is bad enough. But if you'd put it in the middle, okay, right? But the main event, will anybody in Chicago ever forgive him that had money invested in this? Sure. Wrestling fans are fickle. They'll be back. <sighs> well, again, they didn't get Punk versus MJF or Punk at all or any... They get this. And... I know some people are going to say, well, he's been more serious lately. He's actually doing the wrestling moves. If a chimpanzee can do the wrestling moves, doesn't that just devalue the business as a whole rather than make the chimpanzee a star? Moxley won it, and it took him 20 fucking minutes. But he didn't bleed. Pockets did. And they kicked out of everything. Of course they did. I mean, I didn't watch it because I'm not going to dignify this foolishness with my time. But that's what garbage wrestlers do, is they fantasize that they're real athletes and they go about imitating the moves that they have seen money-drawing talent do. And they kick out of all of them to show how tough they are. And then somebody finally figures, okay, we've done everything we know how to do. Let's just stop. But that's all it is with Orange Cassidy. And people are like, oh, he's a great worker because he has this gimmick, which is ridiculous. And we're supposed to just accept it and let it play into everything. Why is he a great worker? Because he could do some of the moves and because he kicks out of everything. I feel like that's all it takes for certain people. If you could take a big move and kick out a two and a half and get them to go, oh, and then do that again within 30 seconds, and then repeat that within 15 to 20 seconds later, add another one, about 45 seconds later, keep repeating this, maybe let the other guy get a few in there, 
That's all it takes. It's that simple for a lot of people. It's just not that simple for me. Moxley's the worst wrestler in the business. It's amazing when you hear things like Danielson say, Moxley's the best wrestler in the business. It's the exact opposite. I'm telling you, Danielson is either too nice or he's had too many concussions or possibly a mixture of the two. Because he's involved in a bunch of shit that a guy with his talent could easily say no to and shouldn't be anywhere near. And the plumber is one of them. They fit like oil and fucking crankcase solution. Before we uh, wrap this up, just one quick note. I did watch some of the- Are we almost there? Yeah. Well, that was the main event, right? This is it? Holy ma- no, it wasn't the main event. It was the last match. Go ahead. Um, Tony Khan, Tony Khan, Tony Khan at the media scrum said they estimate that according to preliminary reports, the pay-per-view did it in the area of a hundred thousand buys. They think all in last week did 200,000 buys and he plans on this being a recurring annual thing all in and then Labor Day weekend right back to all out in Chicago. What are your thoughts about that here? Good, on pay-per-view a week apart. We assume it'll be on pay-per-view next year. You never know where their streaming rights will end up or the premium live event rights. Oh, well, he. this was such a rousing success for him. He sold more tickets than any show has ever sold and as a result fired his biggest star and came back and killed the biggest market in the United States for fucking AEW wrestling in the course of a weekend. And... He did 200,000 buys for the pay-per-view in Wembley, if, if that's a fact. Well, I figured they would because their normal is 150 or 160, and this was the biggest show of all time, and everybody was curious about it. And then he comes and does a half of that a week later. He ought to be goddamn turning cartwheels if he could get 100,000 people to buy this thing when nobody knew what was going to fucking happen. But, goddamn... Do you think anybody's going to buy it next time when they not only know, don't know any of the matches, but they know that last time they put on a show where you didn't know any of the matches, it fucking stunk? Well, that's the disconnect right there. There are fans who loved it. There are fans who, and I'm not joking, and I'm not even saying this to get you fired up, they believe this is one of the greatest pay-per-views of all time, that the match quality is off the scale, everything was great. Those fans see it that way. I see it as kind of an average pay-per-view at best with a couple of good moments or matches. But there are other people who think it's like one of the all-time great, the strap match in combination with the Moxley match, with the Omega match, the Bucks and FTR match. It's one of the greatest shows of all time. Where were all these easily pleased people when we had to sell them tickets every fucking week? It would have made our job so much easier. They weren't even in the womb yet. That's the issue. All righty. Well, do you have room in your womb for more wrestling? We can talk about it on the next program you're hosting. I, I if, if it, no. Uh, <laughs> I would love to talk about wrestling, just not any of this stuff. Well, that's what, well, then it's your show. So make good on your threat and everybody will join us back here for the drive through in a few days. And we're finished here with the experience and the experience that we've had of watching 48 hours of wrestling in a fucking eight-day period. And in parting, we'd like to wish you, our fine listeners, not to have to watch that much wrestling ever, because it sucks. And besides that, thank you, fuck you, bye, everybody. Oh, god damn it. <laughs>